My oldest is a senior in high school and is uh, looking actually at Grace College. Uh, I have a sophomore in high school and then I have boy, girl, nine-year-old twins. And so I have a big range. They keep us busy. Uh, I'm a little tired in that my oldest had a basketball game last night and uh, good news was they won and he played well, but it made the drive a little bit later. But I'm really blessed to be able to be here and to, to share and to have the opportunity to hopefully make a worthwhile investment and actually hopefully be invested back in some by you all. Uh, I've sat many, many times in many, many rooms like this where I've been on the other side uh, of an environment. And what I know is um, it can be very normal for someone to come up and start talking and say things and they may be what you're after, they may be what you're not after, it may be helpful, it may not be helpful, while it may be well done, it's not necessarily always beneficial. And so to be honest, I've got a number of things that I've prepared that I plan to say, um, but I want to give you a chance for a moment to maybe give me some direction on some things you'd like to think about. And so I'm gonna ask you three questions and I want you to put these three questions just for a few minutes. You can write them down, type them in your phone, and then I'm just gonna ask you to shout them out to me in a few minutes, okay? Not right away, but the primary focus of our conversation is about the next generation. And how do we reach the next generation? And what are some things we're doing in our context? What are some things that have worked, not worked? And so I wanna give you these three questions just for you to, to answer right now. Um, what are the main struggles you are currently seeing in reaching the next generation? So what are the main struggles, whether you're in church context or uh, marketplace context or college context, what are the main struggles that you would say? Just put those down in words, whatever you would say the main struggles are. Uh, again, I'll give you a second to think about these, but that's question one. Question two, what would you actually like to talk about in regarding reaching the next generation? Like, what is a specific thing that you would say? Is it methodologies? Is it the way we're teaching? Is it cultural relevance? Is it social media? What is it you want to, maybe you're like, yes, 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 yes. Um, what, what is it that you want to talk about in regarding your actual, um, uh, the things that you, you really, really care about? And then this is not directly connected to that, but here, here's, it's, a, it's related, but it's not necessarily about the next generation. What personal leadership topics do you want to discuss? Like, take them out of next generation for a second and go, what are some leadership topics that you go, I just want to understand how to get better at that. I want to talk about that. I want to think about that. All right, so those three questions. What are the current struggles that you're seeing in reaching the next generation? What would you like to talk about in reaching the next generation? And what would you like to talk about in terms of just... Um, actual leadership struggles or leadership challenges that you are facing. Um, as you're contemplating those things, uh, let me remind you of the scriptures are very clear that where we are and when we are are not accidental. God has chosen to place you where he has placed you right at this time so that you would do what you're doing and people would find out that God is not far away. Uh, there may be other contexts to which you wish you could minister in, and some of us have been in ministry long enough to remember the way things once were. But I would suggest that lamenting what not is or what used to be is not very helpful for moving forward based on where we are. The context we have is the context we have, whatever that is, the culture is what the culture is, whatever that is. Complaining about it, being frustrated about it, arguing about it, and um, being cynical about it doesn't solve problems. It doesn't reach people. And God in his sovereignty chose to put you there now. Wherever that is. He chose to put you there now. Acts 17 talks about this. It talks about God appointing people to be at a place on purpose for a time so that people will see that God is not far away as you live your life. And so what I want to remind you is that your assignment is not an accident and that your opportunity is unique. In fact, I want to suggest to you that rather than lamenting and being frustrated sometimes about our cultural context, particularly in North America, 
I actually think we have a chance to have one of the greatest harvests we've ever had. I think we stand at one of the precipices of the opportunity to have some of the most significant ministry that's ever existed. Uh, I was listening to some things even driving here last night and there's, uh, let me just say this for context. Um, I know that for some people, you know, Drew said, I pastor a good sized church and the church has grown. And I know for some people that's a positive when a guy like me gets up and for some people that's a negative when a guy like me gets up. For some people, they filter, it must just be about numbers, or it must just be about um, they're watering something down, or uh, it's just about a big church and all of that. Listen, my heart's to see people meet Jesus, and my heart is to see people grow. And when you do that one person at a time, things get bigger. And then at some point, to be honest, the bigness becomes a complication and becomes difficult. Um, But I do serve in a big church, and I would say that Uh, what we have seen is that we are continuing to effectively reach the next generation. Uh, There is a retreat that several churches connected to our world go to that meets in Kalahari, which is a water park up in the north side of Ohio, up near uh, Cedar Point. And uh, we sent almost 600 people to that last weekend, about 520 kids that went up to that in addition to leaders. We have a young adult ministry at our main campus, just at the Pickerington location, that's roughly about 200 kids, 200 young adults a week. And so we have a lot going on that I could continue to tell you about reaching the next generation. The median age of our church, I don't know what it is, but just suffice it to say, we don't do many funerals. We have a young church. We have a church where a lot of people continue to move forward. I'm 45. I've been the lead pastor there. It'll be 20 years in July. My first weekend, 52 people. My first Christmas, 83 people. And this past Christmas, 7,000. And in that progress, one of the things I would say we are consistently trying to do is to ask, how do we reach the next generation? Because we know that if we don't, eventually your church has begun to die. You have about a 40-year window to keep your church moving forward. And if you don't go back and reach it, you're going you're gonna to struggle. All right. Context. This is where I want to start. I want to define reality. For some of you, this will be review. Some of you have seen some of these things. For others of you, this will be uh, brand new. Uh, listening to a thing driving over here last night, uh, a guy was going through some stats about biblical worldview. And I don't know, they didn't give the definition of how they defined biblical worldview. But they said if you were a a baby boomer, so um, you uh, are, I think it's defined as uh, 1948 or so or beyond. uh, Baby boomers, they said that in America at the time, it was about 55% of the people would have identified with a biblical worldview. If you grew up as a baby boomer. Then they went to the next generation And uh, that next generation, which would be my generation, they said it was about 44% of the populace said that they had a biblical worldview. And then you begin to get to millennials, and millennials, they would say it was somewhere between 20 to 25%, maybe as low as 19%. Then when you get to Gen Z, it dropped all the way as low as 5%. So in 1948 to where we are today, you're talking about 56, 55, 56% of the people saying biblical worldview, sympathetic to the causes and thoughts of Christianity, all the way down to about 5% of people that are dealing with it. Now, some of you have been in some rooms where I've presented this. Some of you, majority of you probably haven't been. Some of you may have even seen uh, some other people talk about this. But what I want to just put up for a second is an understanding again of reality and to just talk about where we are And what I find when we do this is that for some of us, um, this helps put words to what you're feeling. If you're a pastor, what your people are feeling. If you're a leader, what you're feeling, all of those kind of things. Uh, Many of us uh, have PTSD and recall all that COVID did and the time period that was COVID and what uh, what that challenged and shaped in us. And um, COVID psychologists, sociologists, they refer to it in a lot of different ways, but one of the ways is they refer to it as a cultural convulsion. And they say that the only time there was a, the last time there was a cultural convulsion like this would have been the civil rights movement. Out of the civil rights movement came the Jesus movement, which had an unbelievable effect of effectiveness for Christianity. 
But the cultural convulsion that was COVID changed our culture, highlighted things that were already happening in our culture. To be honest, what it did is it put gasoline on things that were already going on in our world. So um, a couple books that I would encourage you to read if you haven't read them, a book by Mark Sears, uh, Mark Sayers, it's actually S-A-Y-E-R-S. It's called Disappearing Church. He has another book called Reappearing Church, but if you haven't read those, I recommend them, Disappearing Church. Um, another uh, 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 a sociologist to look into, not a Christian, is a guy named Philip Reef. He has talked a lot about what's going on in our culture that is helpful to understand. And then if you've never read Carl Truman's Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, you've got to read it and understand so much of what's going on in our world. So again, Mark Sears, Sayers, Disappearing Church. Look into Philip Reef. He's a sociologist. And then... Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll reference that in a second. Uh, and then The Rise and Fall, uh, uh, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. The book that Trent is holding up in the back is the book that I would say gives some really good blocking and tackling about evangelism. It's called Evangelism in a Skeptical Culture. It's by Sam Chan. Sam's a pa pastor, speaker, leader, author, really good uh, resource. I highly encourage you to grab it. Great, if you want to grab them. They're really good, and it's a really good book. Um, some, several of our leadership staff read it, and it, it was really helpful. So what I want to do is talk about what um, some of you have heard me talk about, and called of the, it's called the three cultures, or understanding the three cultures. So just think of these cultures in and of themselves. Blue's not going to work. Um, these cultures in and of themselves are not good or bad per se, as much as we want to make them good or bad. Um, so culture one uh, is marked by um, a, a lot of different things, but as it's marked, it's, it's actually a culture that when we think about it, at its core, it's polytheistic. It's marked by many gods. And when we think about some of the things that would be here, it would be marked in its biggest label as pre-Christian. This is a culture that has a deep reverence for spiritual things. It would be a culture that says um, there are gods and we, we need to appease. We need to figure out how to make those gods happy. Uh, and so this is a culture that we often think of in a um, learning sense as primitive, not very educated, a little bit backwards. Culture two, this is where we would say Christian culture. This is uh, monotheistic, so we would say one God. Oftentimes we would say we think of Judeo-Christian realities to it. Uh, sacred, we would also say they're creedal, these folks. Um, and there's commandments that allow you to know what to do, right? Then you go to third culture. This would be in certain term, in, in the biggest sense, post-Christian. God here would not be many gods or one God, but self. And in this, it sets itself up against the second culture. Up against second culture. And its highest values are personal authority. self, all those kind of things. Okay, let you have a chance to kind of look at that and digest that. When you look at this reality, what many of us in this room, and I, and I can say this because I can look around and I can do a pretty good job of just seeing how old we are. When I look at us, most of us in this room, we were trained and equipped to reach two cultures. We were trained to go reach this culture, this is a lot of the missions movement that existed for 50, 60 years from North America backwards. Or we were trained to reach into our own culture. We were trained to reach in a culture that already agreed with us part of, or was sympathetic to us. Part of the problem that most of us are experiencing right now is that you still want us to be here or think we're here and we're trying to reach this culture. 
And this culture has a whole different set of values and parameters to the way that they want to live their life and they want to think about things. Furthermore, there's also another challenge that your people feel and that you feel. And it's that this culture is actually evangelizing that culture. This culture, for the first time, is telling us you're wrong. And the reason is the perceived thought by people is that the more you go this way, the smarter or enlightened you are. Which is why your people, like I have a bunch of people in my church who work at Ohio State. They work at Ohio State, they work at Nationwide, they work at AEP, American Electric Power. And they live in a world where their companies are creating policies that at their core are in a lot of ways anti-Christian. They don't say it that way, but they are. And so they go to work and they're like, Pastor Keith, they want me to sign this document that says I won't do this or I won't say that. They want me to feel this way about inclusion or whatever it is. And what they're feeling is this. They're feeling the culture trying to evangelize them to tell them that they're wrong. Most of your church kids that are 25 and under in your church, they're probably 2.5s. <laughs> they've been raised in your home or in your church, but they've been impacted by all the things of your culture. So the question is, what are you on purpose doing to do this? I mean, that's the, that's the like $70 million question. How do you effectively, when you've been trained and equipped and you, a lot of us, this is what we've known, how do we do this? Now, let me say a couple things. Um, none of these is inherently right or wrong. Do you know that there are Christians and non-Christians that exist in all of these cultures? One of the biggest delusions that makes me laugh in my 45 years is that we all act like everybody in America was a Christian at some point. We, we all act like everybody in our world was living for Jesus and connected to the gospel. There's lots of non-Christians that live here. There's a lot of challenges that come with this. There's a lot of challenges that come with this. There's also opportunities that come with this. So what we are trying to understand, what we've been trying to figure out, is how do we do this? What does it look like? How do you reach this? And to understand that this is where people are. You can be frustrated, but it's where they are. And it's particularly where the next generation is. Um, for some people, when they look back at this, what their fear is, is this was like a fear of colonialism. But when we look at this, what people fear going this way, is people fear, I have a fear that we're actually going to be converted to their side. One of the reasons that so many people are afraid to engage this is because they're afraid of being converted to thinking like culture three. And they're afraid of being converted to culture three because let's say this out loud, we have a lot of people that call themselves Christians that aren't, and we have people who call themselves Christians who are not rooted in good theology to be able to deal with what needs to be dealt with when they go into this world. As you begin to think about this, there's what's called first space, third space, and uh, first space, second space, third space. You see this very clearly in actually Acts 17. First space is your turf. Second space is neutral turf. And third space is their turf. When Paul went to uh, Athens, he went to the synagogue. That's his turf. That's come to my church. Then he went to the marketplace. That's neutral turf. That's a coffee shop. Then he was invited to the Areopagus. That's their turf. He got invited into their space. The, this is so important. This is so important for the next generation. The cutting edge of ministry is when you are invited into other people's third space. What we do is we hope that we can get everyone to come to our turf. I pastor a big church. We have a big invite culture. We want people to come. But the cutting edge of ministry is when you're asked to go speak at their turf. So 
this is going to sound terrible, and I'm not trying to disparage the moment I'm in or chapel next week or any of that. But of my speaking engagements that I have on my calendar right now, probably one of the ones I'm the most excited about is that it's the second time I've been invited to go speak to the big public high school in my town's leadership cabinet. And they're not Christians. They don't go to my church. And I'm being invited to go have an audience with them, to love them, serve them, care about them, and shape them. That's being invited to their turf. Now, I hope that I do that well and continue to do that to where that can happen. But it's beginning not by me saying, come to our church, but it's this over here. So part of what I want to say is, if you're going to be someone that's lived over here and reaches these people, you have to find a way to be able to get invited into people's third space and to be able to reach them. All right, I'm going to pause because I'm giving you a lot here. I want to go somewhere from here. Questions, clarifications, thoughts about this because this is primarily right now to define reality. Anything? Yeah, Jordan. Yep. How um how are how do you suggest we like root the people to go? Right? Yep. Like where the where the How do we root the people to in this space to do this well? Yeah, yeah we'll talk about that. Yeah. Yep, yep. It's not and it's it's not just root uh, root the people, it's also um make sure we're ready even as leaders. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, we're going to, this is an answer that when someone like me says this, it's so unsatisfying, but it's just the truth. It's relationship. You have to offer them some type of commodity that they think is valuable enough for them to want you in their space. And that looks a lot of different ways. That commodity is... Um, great content that they don't think they can get somewhere else. That commodity is your fun. That commodity is your cool. That commodity is you have experience that they don't know and you're like a dad to them or a mom to them that they need. That commodity is that you have a brand that they actually want to represent themselves. It can be a lot of things. But you have to have something that they have that is able to show up in a relational form that they want. Um... And if you don't have that and you show up, they don't care. They, they don't care. I mean, part of effectiveness as a parent is relationship, right? It's building that relationship with your kids to be able to say the things that you need to be able to say. Um, it's relationship. Um, it's also being awesome at your craft. Like, I mentioned this, like, that you are good enough at what you do. Like, a guy who's been a master at this, and I'm not saying this because he's a Christian, but his, like Tim Tebow's mastered this. Erwin McManus on the West Coast has mastered this. They've gotten invited to the worlds of sports and fashion. Uh, John Maxwell has mastered this. They're invited into rooms that none of us would ever be invited in, and they bring the gospel with them because they're excellent at their craft. Right there, they bring something with them that they're able to that is unique, and so they get invited into that space. Now, sometimes the craft is, and I'll get to this, but a big portion of that uh, twenty-five and under generation, what they actually long for because they haven't had it done well, is they actually long for second parents. Do you know how many people in your church or in your world that are under twenty-five that if they would someone would teach them how to cook or smoke meat, they would love the whole day. Do you know how many young people under the age of 25 that if you would take them to a basketball game with you and hang out and then go get wings and just spend time and then say, hey, do you know how to do your finances? 
and they would eat it up. Because a lot of them, what we think is they want friends. They don't need friends. They need people that can help them. They need parents. And a lot of them don't have parents in a lot of ways. And one of the things that we can offer them is to come alongside and be like, no, I'll step into your life. It's amazing to me how many young people in our church are just blessed by the presence of these people being like aunts and uncles to them in so many ways. So, I mean, that's part of it. What, what else? I'll come to that in some more specific detail later. What else? What else about this do you want to think about process? couple byproducts of where we are. Again, this has been written about all over the place, but again, I'm just trying to continue to define um, reality. Hyper-individualism. Um, number two, another thing that's marked by it is privatization of faith. And then the third one is actually demonization of faith. These show up in Culture 3. Um, there's so much research on this, but um, our culture is, is, if you assess the culture in our world, in America, about what were the chief values 50 years ago and what are the chief values now, you'll see that things like patriotism don't matter anymore. And, it's, and the biggest reason is not just because of the MAGA movement or Joe Biden, it's because they don't think about groups. They think about themselves. Um, there's a privatization of faith. Keep that in your room. Don't, don't evangelize me. And then there's a demonization of faith, which is your thoughts are actually dangerous. We've moved to a place in our culture where we say things like words are violence, silence is violence, um, all that kind of stuff. And these are affecting all of that. All right. Any other thoughts? Or I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move on. Uh, I'm gonna move on. But any other thoughts about the context? Okay. Um, I'm gonna erase this. So if anyone was about to take a picture, or you need it. It's gone. Um, a book, a book that I would encourage you to read again that just gives a little bit more color to this is the Great De Churching. If you haven't read it yet. In the last 25 years, 40 million people in North America who used to go to church have stopped going to church. In the last 25 years, whoops, I'm sorry, I already erased that. In the last uh, 25 years, 40 million people, this book outlines a lot of who those are, how we got there, and um, one of the things that's just really fascinating about the, what the book talks about um, I guess one of, is a reminder and then the other is just something to call out. Um, it gives the categories for who these people are and what's happened. But um, this is a reminder that when, even when you look at this, there are huge amounts of people in your community that are not churched, that actually once were churched and are open to it. Because what it says in the book is that in every one of the subcategories of the de church community, over 50% of them say that they would come back to church if properly invited. If properly invited, and listen, what they say is, the invitation needs not just to be to the church, but to the kitchen table of that person. So they say, I'm open to coming back to church. I will come back to church. But, but what I need is a real relationship to make it happen. So don't just invite me to your church. Invite me to come have dinner with you so that I would know you as well. So in this context of reaching people, we've lost a bunch of people that used to be churched that could be churched again, and it's probably about an invitation, uh, one invitation that they're away from. All right? Okay, I'm going to start to go through some blocking and tackling of some things that I think are important to do, but I want to stop, and I want you to answer the questions that I gave you, the first two. All right? So this is a, a participation. It doesn't work unless you talk. Um, what are the struggles that you would articulate right now in reaching the next generation? When I asked you question one, and I said write it down, type it out, tell me what you, are, you would say are your struggles.
Okay, so is it an accurate representation to say the tradition of that church is the problem? Okay, so tradition of some churches. Okay, what else? What are the problems, challenges we're facing in reaching the next generation? Time, um, like time scheduling things, so like parents prioritizing other things. Okay, so that's impacting our proximity with them because of their what's going on. Okay, so um, uh, culture schedule has changed, which has affected things. Okay, what else? What other challenges are you facing reaching the next generation? Not enough leaders to teach. Great. What else? A broader acceptance of what truth is. So the challenge of their understanding of truth is, is being warped. Okay. Okay, yep. Um, I'll just leave it there. I got it. I put atheism and Gnosticism. Okay, what else? What else? Families that want a youth program want to come in with a church that already has a Bible youth program. Yeah. It's hard, especially if there's, I hate to say it this way, but especially if there's a really good game in town from a competitor church. It's really hard. And I, and I know that both from being the really good game in town, and I also know it from when we've campused or planted churches, how hard it is to ask people to leave this incredibly established youth group to go be a part of this small thing and go make it happen. Very difficult. I think it's a combination of anxiety that young people face and then a leader in the school relationship. Yep. So you've got the mental health challenges that are prevalent. Uh, and then um, you said because of that, the impact of really. Like yeah, they're, they're sometimes even afraid to walk into a room. So the impact of that on relationships. Good. What else? Well, you just mentioned hyper individualism. Yeah. That's the air that's being breathed. How do you yep. address that? Social media. Yeah, and this is contributing to a lot of a lot of different things. Gender imbalance. I'm sorry. Gender imbalance. Yeah. The whole the whole gen. Yeah, the whole gender, you said gender imbalance, more women serve it in. In, in our church. Yep. And particularly in that group of yep. the next generation, uh, way more than men and women. Okay. In terms of numbers and quality. Okay. A couple other thoughts. What are other challenges? Sure. Yep. I feel uh, children's ministry along with youth ministry. Keep going. Keep going. All right, so just hold. Sure. Yeah. Um, I have four kids in three school districts. One in a very big public school, one in a very small private Christian school, twin boy-girl in a small Christian school. 
And um, uh, there's a zillion things Kelly and I get wrong about parenting, a zillion. One of the things I think we've gotten right is we've said, we're gonna listen to what our kids want and pay attention and not try to parent them all in the same environments. What I will tell you is environment is unbelievably significant. My oldest who goes to a small Christian school where social media is irrelevant. They don't care about it, they don't think about it, they don't talk about it, it doesn't matter. And my daughter who goes to a big public school where social media is a really, really big deal. And the impact of that on both of them is unbelievable. And some would say it's a boy and a girl. It's not. It's, it's way different. The impact of how that is shaping them is so important. And so one of the things I think that we have to really be honest about is to really be honest about the environments that our kids are in, in the spaces that they're in. What is, if you're a pastor of a local church, what really is the public high school culture like there in terms of those things and the pressure and understanding that? Um, and some of us, here's why I say this, some of us go fight social media and you don't need to. It's really not the problem. Others of us, we don't ever talk about social media. We just say it's what kids do, whatever. And it's a huge issue. Like you have to be really, really honest to know what's really, really going on in that culture. All right, I'm going to go through a handful of things that we've thought about some of them will get to some of these, and, um, and some of them won't, uh, and, and we'll, we'll move from there. All right, what are we doing to try to think about how to go culture two, culture three, be effective to reach the culture three? The first thing that we've recognized is that you better figure out how to equip your people to do family discipleship well. A lot of us want the answer to be institutional and not familial. If you're truly going to address children's ministry, quality students that are ready to lead, figuring out how to raise up young men, I could keep going. It starts here. I'm going to ask you a brutal question that it was for me at least at one point. If you're a local church pastor, how much are you really discipling your families to disciple their families? Not how much are you teaching them well at church, which is part of it. Not how good are your programs, which is part of it. Not how good is your student ministry, which is part of it. But how are you equipping moms and dads at home to actually lead their kids spiritually? When we deconstruct so much of our society and what's going on, if we were to all have like the seven hour lunch and do it, what we would come back to over and over is that one of the biggest problems is the family is broken down. If we're going to actually really figure this out, we have to raise our people to be strong families and disciple their family. So honestly, like that's not a drop kick. I got you. I was in a room like this and someone asked me that question and I spent the whole drive home from the event just frustrated in my head going, we're not doing a good enough job. We're not doing a good enough job. What we're doing, we're doing great. But we're not doing a good enough job to say, how do, you how do you help your parents know how to disciple around a dinner table? How do you help your parents know how to disciple around windshield time, driving the kids to practice? How do you help your parents understand how to disciple through decision making? And here's, here's what I know, and this is going to be so hard, some of you are not going to like me for saying this. This doesn't always mean more Bible study. This doesn't always mean higher levels of family devotions. Here, here are a couple principles. Learn to talk in sentences about faith, not paragraphs. They don't need another sermon sometimes. They need to know the thought and drive at that. Right? Um, learn to ask yourself... Um, where is the captured time that already exists that I don't have to create new time? 
If you have a child who doesn't have a driver's license and you're driving them around all the time, you have captured time. Take advantage of it. How do you learn to parent through questions instead of statements? I'm so bad at this and the Lord's teaching me this. And how do I think about these things to figure out how to do discipleship in my family better? There's so much that can be said. We spend a ton of time. But, but the answer is not, and this is what you need to know. A lot of times when I come talk in a room, people leave and they send me messages and we talk later. And what they'll say sometimes is some version of this. You can do that because you're a big church. I can't do that because I'm a small church. And I want to say, stop it. This has nothing to do with the size of your church. This has nothing to do with the size of your ministry. This is saying, are we on purpose equipping our parents to be able to do this? All right, that's, that's the, second, the first one. Second one, and, and some of these you're going to go, I don't even know if this is strategy about the next generation, but it is. Um, uh, the second one is your health. Fighting this battle from second culture to third culture and reaching it is really, really hard. And here's what I'm watching. I'm watching some of the best people get out of the game because they're tired. I'm watching some of the most important people in our context quit because it's difficult. Are you taking care of yourself? I'm not talking about selfishness. But like, are you healthy? You know this. You make stupid decisions when you're tired. It's the whole Snickers, you know, advertisement, you're not you when you're hungry. Like, when you're not healthy, you can't just... COVID exposed this at a massive level in ministry. People who are struggling with a bunch of stuff. If you're going to get in this battle, like, there's a, there's a, old, a TV show that used to be on that was really popular, and this one guy said he could, he's like, I could run a marathon. I could run a marathon. And he, so he went and he ran a marathon in the show. And then he was coming home from the marathon and he sat down on a subway and then he tried to stand up and he couldn't stand up. And he literally just rode the subway and he couldn't move. And the point was, he couldn't do it without training. There's so many of us that are trying to do ministry in a really hard context and we're not healthy. We're not healthy. We're not prepared for this. And, and some of it's obvious, like... Um, I have a large church staff. One of the first things I say to them in onboarding, I make no assumptions that because you work at a church that you're a healthy Christian. Are you taking care of your own spiritual soul? Are you spending time with God? I tell my staff this all the time. The most important thing I have to give Grace Fellowship is my personal spiritual intimacy with my Heavenly Father. Are you taking care of yourself? Whatever that means, physically, nutritionally, sleep, rest, whatever it is, recharging. How do you have fun? How do you enjoy your wife? How do you have a great marriage? How do you, what, are you healthy? There's a lot of us that the reason this isn't happening is because this is tiring and you can't do it. You can't do it. And so are you personally healthy? All right, third one. Relationship, relationship, relationship. How are we trying to do this? We're trying to build relationships. How are the ways that we're trying to build relationships? Well, the fundamental thing that we're trying to do, Jordan was hinting at this with their schedules, is we're trying to create environments where we get proximity with them, where we're near them. How do we create spaces to be near them? And there's lots of ways. I was answering uh, Elaine's conversation question a little bit earlier with that. Some of it is your skill or your craft. Some of it is your, your, I'll just call it fathering or anting, like stepping in and listening to them and helping them with life. Some of it is fun. Some of it is brand. But how do you create things to have proximity? Now, here's also what I know. There's a bunch of churches that create ministries that put their kids in the building and then their leaders never actually step into proximity with the kids. So it doesn't do any good if 
I have students that are all over there hanging out and all my leaders that are supposed to be shaping them spend two hours over here. Proximity isn't we're in the same room, it's that we're together. So part of this question is, are you empowering your leaders to reach the next generation to run a program or to build relationships? And the answer is, of course, both. But do you have ways that you are truly building a relationship, like truly building a relationship um, to make this work and that you're really spending time with them? Um, again, helping them with finances. Uh, the currency of our day is trust. How are you building trust? How are you building trust? Yeah. No, no, no. These are just things we are doing. Okay. Things we are doing. Yeah, if you just said, if you said, if we were having coffee and you said, Keith, what are you guys trying to do to reach Culture 3? I would say, well, we're trying to figure out how to make sure we equip our families better to do discipleship. We're trying to figure out how to make sure our personal healths are right. We're trying to do the relationship. Not in any order. These are just things that we're trying. All right? Number four. <clears throat> um, I erased these. Number four is we as a church are committed to giving our best leaders to the next generation. You guys have heard the stats. The majority of people make a decision for Jesus before the age of 18. Most people fall away before the age of 22. People are making their most important formation decisions about their worldview before 25, all these things. I remember hearing, um, reading an article years and years ago about a church, and the article was titled, it was titled like, 42 Ways Your Church Will Never Be Like My Church. And I was already annoyed at the article. I was like, I don't like this article already. And I read the article, and in the article, one of the things that they challenged uh, people who were reading the article with was, they said, we give our best leaders to everyone young adult and below. And then they listed the reason why. And I read it and it rocked my world. And I was like, there's a bunch of stuff that's right about this. Bunch of stuff that's right about this. And so I came back. I talked to my elders about it. And for about eight years, the lead pastor of a mega church, I led a small group for seniors in high school. That's the, my primary small group investment was for seniors in high school. I'm not doing that right now because of the stage of life of my kids. It's a little bit hard with my family, but I will go back to it. But here's what I'll tell you. I taught at high school ministry this past weekend on our, at our gathering. I regularly teach at it. I regularly send our best leaders to it. Our best leaders, we have multiple elders that are involved in small groups with our students. Because we believe that if we're going to reach them, we need to cast a vision to have some of our best investing in that group. So some of our best leaders in our whole church work with our young adult ministry, our high school ministry, or our middle school ministry. And we on purpose choose that and talk about it. I want it to be that way. My wife works with our high school students. Uh, I would say of one of my ministries outside of my job, it's primarily with our high school students. I hang out with them. I'll go do things with them all the time and invest in them. Your best leader spending time with them. And you know this, when you're one of your best leaders and you go spend time with other leaders, you're not only helping the ministry by reaching the kids, you're shaping those leaders. Because you're with them and teaching them and, and engaging them and they're watching the things that you're asking and the things that you're doing. So we try to put some of our best leaders to it. Uh, all right, this one is going to take a little bit to talk about. Um, we have to teach them in a unique way, teach, preach, however you want to talk about it. Um, we're thinking about it strategically in the way that we teach and preach to them. Um, there's so much here, and this is like, this is like a whole day of conversations, but um, I'm going to try to draw some things up to think about this. Um, a couple things, though, that I'll just say right off the jump about this. Um, most of us have stopped 
we don't say it this way, but we've stopped teaching the basics of Christianity and we need to go back to it. We are assuming baseline knowledge of our next generation far too much. Even those who have grown up in church. Um, probably three years ago as I was recognizing that my oldest son was about to graduate, I got out the Westminster Catechism, like the short version, and I literally just kept like a copy of it on my phone. And when I was in the car with him and we'd be going somewhere, I would pick one thing, and I, Caden doesn't know this. I never said, hey, Caden, we're going through the Westminster Catechism, buddy. We're going line by line. He has no idea. He wouldn't even know that's what I was doing. But I found different aspects of it, and then I would find a question to ask him in relationship to it. And I'm still doing it. And here's what rocked my world. I was blown away how much of it he couldn't get right. Blown away. And he's been at every camp, every retreat, goes to church, pastor's kid, family devotions, yada, 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 yada. He doesn't know. He doesn't know. I remember in COVID when it was like we had shut down for a little bit and we're talking about going back. I remember looking at my wife and I'm like, if I don't want to watch the church in our living room and I'm the pastor of the church, how many people don't want to watch the church in our living room? If my kids can't figure this stuff out, what's going on? We have to go back and be honest about this. Here, here, here's, here's a question. What do you really want your specific groups of students to know at the end of those times? What do you want the average middle school student to know when you're done with them? What do you want the average high school student to know when you're done with them? What do you want the average young adult to know when you're done with them? And can you say you've done everything to set that up? And is it the right stuff? Has it really been the basics? Have we really gotten it? Ton of stuff we're assuming. Second thing is, this is going to sound weird because it's, it's a skill, but like, for some of us, we need to have the death to nuance. And what I mean by that is we've lived in a world where we've tried to walk the line of sensitivity so much that sometimes we've taught our kids nothing because we haven't actually told them what it said. So um, a far more difficult context for church ministry than my context is New York City. And a person who's brilliant about this is Pastor John Tyson. And John Tyson said something years ago that I heard that he said, he said, the people in your church and the people in our world don't need less of our sexual ethic explained. They need more of our sexual ethic explained. And more, listen, more of our sexual ethic doesn't mean yelling about what we think is wrong. It means telling people what is beautiful and what is great about what God has created as well. And some of us, we've spent so much time teaching something like sexuality to our students with all the death of a thousand qualifications before we ever get to it, that by the time we get to it, they're not even sure what we think. We have to be more specific and direct. Listen, more specific and direct does not mean harsh. It does not mean mean. It does not mean moral policing in an unhealthy way. But we have to be clear. And we're not being clear a lot of times. And we got to figure out how to do it. Um, in Proverbs, there's kind of like, you know, three categories that we think about when we think about the way people are described, right? You've got the wise, the simple, or the fool, and then you've got evil in Proverbs when it comes out. And when you think about these people, um, these are people that are like, you know, they're kind of all in, Bible-believing, and their heart is committed. These are people um, that they're... Um, heart is submitted, but their head is undisciplined or un undiscipled. And these are people that are actively opposing. Proverbs, you know, shows this up all the time. What we have done sometimes is we've spent all of our time yelling at these people instead of discipling these people. It's what our culture is good at. There's actually a concept in marketing that is interestingly very similar. Category one, category two, category three, 
This is brand advocates. This is brand apathy. And this is brand uh, opponents. And here's what they found. That cat, listen, this is huge. Category two becomes whatever category you speak to. If you talk about brand opponent issues all the time, category two actually turns into category three people. If you talk about why people should be a brand advocate, you talk about everything that's great, category two people actually become category one people. We have spent so much time in our church talking about this stuff instead of talking about the beauty of what is the truth that many of our people have become sympathetic rather than discipled over here. We need to teach the full counsel in, to our people and we need to teach it in a way that is moving the simple to be the wise, not that we're just trying to prevent the evil. Um, I heard a pastor say it this way and I thought it was so good. He said, for so long I was prioritizing the feelings of the evil that I, I was prioritizing the feelings over the evil over the needs of the wise. And when we talk to the wise, the simple actually move this way. Not when we talk to the evil, they move this way. So we've got to talk about that. We've got to be interested. Um, we have to be willing to talk about what the culture is talking about. This is, this is challenging, and it's a place I've had to change. Um, if you're a church lead pastor, I would say um, you don't build your ministry on controversy, but you also don't run from controversy. So we try to say one, what we would call one significantly controversial series a year. And in that series, we're going to talk about What's going on in the culture from a biblical perspective? So I'll give you an example. We did a series not long ago at our church called My Response Is, and it was a response to what some of us know as the secular creed. Secular creed is like the sign that gets put in restaurants and hyper-urban areas. Um, no person is illegal. Women's rights are rights. Uh, love is love. Science is real. And so we said we're going to basically, we didn't do all of them, but we're going to go line by line and say, what is my Christian response if I was having coffee to a person over each of those things? And our under 25s were like, thank you. Thank you. Multiple of them walked up to me and they said, I knew what we believed, but two things happened. I felt seen with the problems I'm facing and the things that I'm navigating. And two, you gave me words to talk about this when you're not around. Are you actually speaking to the cultural issues in a way that you're navigating it with death and nuance and you're going? Again, I didn't say, I said one series a year for us. You don't have to do that. Um, but you got to do this basics. But are you talking about it? Um, are you truly teaching your students where they are and what's going on while also making sure you're teaching them the basics? Um, who is teaching your students, and I'll just put it bluntly, are they good? Guys, we don't have to like it, but the internet has been the great leveler because people can find awesome content anywhere. Anywhere. It, if you're a preacher, by the way, this has raised the game on how good a preacher you have to be. Because they know where it's 10 minutes down the road, and you don't have to like it, it's just true. Would you, really, if you don't have kids in that age, but if you had kids in this age, do you want your kids engaging those, kids, those people? Are they good at it? And then I would say, if you're somehow responsible for the developing the communicators in your world, what are you doing to help it? How are you building them and how are you moving forward? So you've got to teach, you've got to preach to it, you've got to work hard at it. There's a lot that can be said about that. There's a lot more conversation. I'm going to give you one more and uh, then we're going we're gonna to take a break. Um, number six let um, let them serve
we work really, 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 really hard to engage the next generation in the grown-up things of our church. Okay, so here, here it is, ready? If you're a great musician and you're a student ministry and you're, in, and you're a high school student, you serve in our real band. If you're great at IT and technology, you serve on the weekend with the real adults. We don't have, for our high school students, we don't have anything for our high school students on the, on, during church because we want them engaged. We want them serving. We want them to believe they are the church. We want them to believe that they are important. They go through the same training and huddles and speeches and talks as all the grown-ups. And we found that if you let them serve and get them involved, man, the ownership of their church and the cross-pollinization of the intergenerational discipleship that happens moves them to be way more effective and way more bought in. So we do everything we can to move them into service at the highest levels as fast as possible. Now we don't fake it or rush it unhealthily, but we want them to serve and we want them to be involved. All right, those are six, a few other ones. Questions on any of these six so far of things that we're trying to do in this? Yeah, Jordan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, how do you walk that balance? I, mean, I, just, I, I know it's super broad. Mm -hmm. To walk that balance of like, I'm gonna, I, I hold firm to this truth, but I'm gonna like speak in a non-authoritative way. Yeah, does that, I, does that make sense? I actually, I, I actually think it's interesting. Do I don't think they need less authority. I think they need more authority. But I think the they, the issue is not authority; it's how it's presented. So I, I think part of the problem is it's been a lack of clarity and not authoritative enough. And it's been sliced and diced so we have large conversations about homosexuality but not large conversations about people living with their boyfriend or girlfriend. We have large conversations about gender ideology issues but we don't have large conversations about pornography the way we should. And it's confusing because they're like, I thought you told me the sexual ethic was all of this and then you spent all your time explaining away why these aren't that a big deal and then you just picked on that. Tell me the whole thing. Tell me all of it. Um, I say, for example, if your friend thinks the only thing that Christians think is wrong about the sexual ethic of our culture is homosexuality, you have done a terrible job conveying to them all that we think is wrong. Because we think a whole bunch is more wrong, more wrong than that. And if they don't know what we think is beautiful, then you haven't told them what we think is beautiful. And what we've just done is we've soundbited it. And it's the reason is, is because we, we gave them the 35-minute talk on the thing, but we nuanced it for 15 minutes before that, that made them never actually hear the full breath. So I don't think they need less authority. I think they need more authority and more clarity. But how they get after that. Yeah. I think it's about, it's, it's not this, it's, come here, come on. And then it's us giving the beauty of the other side of the truth of what God's created. Okay. I was talking about clarity and nuance, and I like, kind of, after I taught one, one Wednesday night, I think, you know, you don't need to qualify things. Like, because I, I qualified something, I, I said, I said, some people think this, or some people believe, I don't even recall what it was. Uh, it could have been like the age of the earth or whatever. She goes, you don't need to qualify things. You know, if this, if this is what the Bible says, you know, don't put some of these other ideas in their head if that's unnecessary. And I, I thought about it, like, yeah, so many times we're, we're like, I, I put words to, you might be hearing this in school or you might be hearing, and, and it's like, I don't even necessarily need to, to do that. Teach the word, be clear, be concise. And then if they have questions, Sure. Open to sure. One -on -one. 
Sure. Yeah, a really helpful exercise is to get the primary people in your church who teach in any environment to compare and contrast the sermon of Acts 2 versus Acts 17. So go look and see what Peter preached in Acts 2, what Paul does in Acts 17, what's similar, what's different about those sermons, how do they engage them. And what we found is we all go, oh, we're living in Acts 17 now, we're not living in Acts 2. Great. But then what a bunch of us do is we start the sermon like we're in Acts 17 and then we preach it like we're in Acts 2. And, and, um, and what I mean by that is we assume a bunch of truths that they could assume in Acts 2 that you couldn't assume in Acts 17 as opposed to being clear about the things that we need to be clear about in a culture that needs us to be clear about what those are. So Acts 17 gives us some great principles on how to be relatable, but we need to tell the full truth without being able to assume. Acts 2 picks up and... There's a bunch of things where if you're not a church person, you don't even know what he's saying. So we need to break that down, but then tell them the Acts 2 truths in the Acts 17 way. And a lot of people don't. They relate in Acts 17, then they just talk like it's Acts 2, and it's not. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's, it's really, really hard, and there's a level that they're at a deficit. But what I would do is, how can you empower those kids with things that help them on their own? So what are we sending those kids home with beyond the craft they made in children's ministry? So there are things we can give them. Um, here's two questions that I want you to ask yourself this week. Here's a Bible memorization that I want you to do coming back this week. So how do we empower them to do their best to disciple themselves? But it's hard. Um, yeah, but I think we can put some things in their hands to help them. Sometimes it's the same things that we're giving the kids that are going home to Christian homes. We're just knowing that the parents can help them. Yeah. Just talking about family discipleship, you said something like um, <coughs> they don't necessarily need more devotional time. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things I could send you. And please hear this. Some families do need disciple, devotional time. Some aren't doing any. Um, but for some, they hear this, and what they do is they go, I'm going to go home, and I'm going to organize a sermon around the dinner table. And that's not necessarily it. What I would say is um, some really basic things like, go Google questions to ask around the dinner table. Go do, have your church do the family dinner challenge. Have you guys ever done that in your children's ministries? So there's a resource out there you can get. And it basically empowers family. I think it's for two months. They get points every time they sit and have dinner as a family. The more points you get, the more points you're able to enter into a drawing. The people win a family thing at the end. I forget what it was. It was a pretty significant prize. But what we were trying to drive was families to have dinner together because of how few families have dinner together. And then when we did that challenge, we empowered them with questions alongside it that came from that resource. But like my family, we went on Google and we bought like, you would think of them as like small group openers, right? Like we bought a box of small group openers that we keep at the dinner table. We grab them, we throw them at the dinner table, and we say, you know, if you were a car, what kind of car would you be? Kids, go. And then we talk about it. And then it's amazing where that leads. So sometimes it's that. Um, sometimes it's like we, we will give parents a book that they should read. And I can give you all. It just depends. But I think the biggest thing is empowering these people principally to think about what are they doing or not doing. Um, are you winning at bedtime? You know, so many of us want to go to, and we want to make it pray, 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 which is great. I try to pray with my kids, especially my little ones. But what I try to ask them more than how can I pray for you is, what's going on in your heart? Hey, hey, Kaya, what's one good thing about your day? What's one bad thing about your day? It's amazing how often that leads to prayer. It's just empowering them to think that way intentionally around that stuff. 
sometimes, you know, um, Cooper, what's your favorite? Cooper's nine, a nine-year-old boy. What's your favorite Bible story, Coop? Just let him talk. Sometimes he gets them wrong. I don't even necessarily correct him. <laughs> you know, he's got Noah going across the Red Sea. We'll figure it out, buddy. We'll get there. <laughs> you know? I got a whole Disney movie for this one, bud. We'll get it. <laughs> but I can send you some of what we've given. You know, there's, there's a ton of great resources out there. Other stuff about this. Yeah. Like, uh, conversations on the stage, or what, what have we found young adults connect with? Yeah, one of the things we found is panels, so multiple voices. Do you do that on Sunday um, we, every once in a while, we don't do it as much on Sunday morning, but we'll do it in young adult ministry and below a fair amount. And then what we've tried to do is create our models for young adults and below that after teaching, there's conversation. So there's small group, Q&A in almost all those environments. So that would be different from the weekend, but we found the value of that pretty significantly. So I don't understand, that didn't make sense, I'm actually angry, can I talk about it with someone? That's probably the biggest place that we've gone. Still monologue or panel, but then quick conversation in circles afterwards. That's probably been the biggest thing that we've shifted to. So not an entirely small group night or not an entirely monologue night, but a hybrid of both of those is what we've found for us has been working the best. Yeah? As like, this generation becomes bigger and takes over a, more of like a majority role in the big church, do you see those like doing more of those things on a Sunday? Or is Sunday in like your head like just set apart as like... No, I, I mean... I think there are certain things the Bible says we have to do when we gather, right? Teach the word, sing, pray, communion, all these things. But the, method, the methods we're always asking, you know, for example, not just the method of how should the service go, but how long should the service go, and how long should a sermon be, and how, all those things we're always asking and evaluating. So maybe it'll change. But I, I think it's interesting somebody brought up attention span. I mean, the fastest pot, the, the fastest growing podcast for young adult men in America is Joe Rogan. He speaks for three hours. The problem is not attention. The problem is content. We, 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 we have people that will binge watch entire shows in a weekend. It's, we are blaming their response to us on their mindset rather than looking in the mirror. It's not a content problem. It's... A, there, people will engage great content. If you're bad, you can never be short enough. If you're good, the problem isn't the length. Isn't a little bit of that environment too, though? Like, I can listen to Joe Rogan on, on a drive. Of course, of course, so yeah. We should put, um, maybe you guys do this in the joke. Have people lost the track during that? Yeah, I mean, there's, <laughs> yeah, I mean there, there is a reality that, like, you know, <laughs> if you said it's the best teacher in the world, but the room smelled like formaldehyde, it would be bad, right? Like, of course environment matters and what you create and what you expect. But I went, my, my wife and I went with a couple other couples to see Nate Bargatze, the comedian in Columbus this past weekend. Um, he spoke for an hour and 32 seconds from the time he started to the time he ended. And he was at Nationwide. There's 18,000 people sold out, right? I counted from my entire section over the course of the hour, four people get up and go to the bathroom. I went to Oppenheimer's, three hours. People didn't leave. It's not, it's not the content, <laughs> or, or it's, not, it's not the time. It's what is said or not said that's valuable. Nobody moved from Nate Bargatze. And they had three other comedians for an hour and a half. People sat in their seat, never got up, never moved, never flinched. These people didn't even go buy a beer. And I'm like, but in church they get up after 15 minutes and they're distracted. And why? It's a, it's not an issue of they can't. People just sat in negative 30 wind chill in Kansas City or in, and watched a football game and didn't move. It's, it, 
And, and this is where I get worked up because the content we have, no offense to Nate Bargatze, is better. So let's figure out how to tell it well. Let's figure out how to do it well in a way that engages and engages young adults. Other thoughts about these? Okay, speaking of um, environment, go to the bathroom. Take a few minutes, get up, grab a coffee. We'll take a few minutes, and then we'll come back and finish before lunch.
All right. How are you? You're doing a good job. Thank you. My name's Roth, by the way. Yeah. Good to see you. Thanks. Yeah, you bet. All right, here we go. I want to. Uh, here's how we're. Here's how we're gonna finish up until lunch. I'm gonna. I'm gonna talk about. Um, I'm gonna talk about three words that I think are really important in connection to uh, some words that maybe you're you're hearing an association with the next generation, and just maybe some terms or ways to think about them. And then I'm just gonna go down a few of these one by one on some of them and give a few thoughts and then that'll probably take us to lunch and then most of this afternoon after lunch I want to talk about some of the questions pastoral leadership questions those kind of things um, I wrote up my email address and my phone number up here please feel free to take those I'm happy if at any point uh, to be able to help you you can text me or send an email um, one of the things that I'll tell you is if you send me an email and it's like specific questions around how we do something, I'm probably just gonna send you to another person on my staff, and they know this. Uh, literally, when I just checked my text messages right now, I just got a message from another guy at another church who said, thank you for putting me in contact with this staff number. We regularly do that, happy to do it, wanna give you all the access we can, so don't hesitate to ask. Um, three words that I think are really important in where we are in ministry and, and, and with this culture um, are the words doubt, um, deconstruction and denial. I'm not sure I understand. I know, Siri. Um, and, uh, and so, um, yeah, it was timely. Um, so doubt, um, as we go through these, the, these are progressively, let's just say, for lack of a better word, worse. Um, everybody has doubt. You probably have doubts. I have doubts. We all have doubts. We shouldn't hurt people and go after people. We should talk with people and clarify doubts. Doubts are okay. We should create environments for the next generation to process their doubts. In fact, one of the challenges that happens is when you create a culture where you people don't feel safe to express those doubts. So it's okay. You can say people have doubts. People are navigating things that we're all works in progress with our faith and we're trying to go after this. Um, deconstruction has kind of two different ways we need to think about it. Sometimes there's good deconstruction and sometimes there's bad deconstruction. Uh, deconstruction, a lot of times you'll hear people say, young people are leaving the church and they're deconstructing their faith. Um, and a lot of times they're not deconstructing their faith, they're denying their faith. And we'll come to that. There are some things in our churches, guys, that need deconstructed. There are things that we've done wrong. There's um, ways that we've been... Um, neglectful or abusive or we haven't been empowering or we haven't been em empathetic we need to grow we need to change we need to learn and sometimes we need to process deconstruction and see what it what's going on and that's good deconstruction but here's what is going on with a lot of people right now a lot of people are using this word deconstruction to really just say I don't trust the Bible anymore and when they get to that place, they're not deconstructing anything. They're denying truth. So the reason I mention this is that I can't tell you how many times in a lunch or a breakfast or a coffee I've gotten out a napkin, I've written these three words, and I've talked to the person across the table, and I've said, what are you really doing? Tell me what's really going on. And they'll say, well, I'm deconstructing. What are you deconstructing? I'm deconstructing my faith. What are you deconstructing about it? And then they say it. Well, the Bible's wrong about that. You're not deconstructing anything. You're in denial of the truth. Let's, let's call a spade a spade and deal with it. Oh, you're deconstructing. You want to understand, how do I really feel about the local church and the way it's created and organized and what's going on? Oh, great. Let's have that conversation. 
Let's, let's talk about it. Let's process that. Let's really, oh, I'm deconstructing the concept of authority as it relates to Scripture, and I really want to understand it. Great. Let's have that conversation. Um, or they say, I'm deconstructing, and there should be no authority in churches. Well, then you're not deconstructing. You're denying the Bible. And so I've just found that if you are armed with like good definitions to process this with people, there's a lot of people in our culture that are saying, I'm just deconstructing, let me deconstruct. And what they're just, they're just, they don't want the Bible, they don't want to submit. So how do you deal with that then? You tell them the truth and say your argument isn't with me or the church, it's with God. Right. And you, you tell them like that that this is I don't I, this isn't at you, but like I think sometimes we act, we, we search for a harder answer than it is. <laughs> um, well, you're telling me that the Bible says that that behavior is wrong and all of our culture doesn't think it's wrong. Our culture's wrong. Says who? Says God. And, 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 and I graciously want to, but I, I don't think there's as much um, art and science to that as we need to make it. No, I, I understand yeah. that. But what do you do from there? Now bring them back to where they do have Yeah. So, yeah. So I think for me, one of the things that I really try to do in a person that's dealing with this is I try to distinguish uh, the person from the issue. And I work really hard to let them know you're denying the Lord around this thing but I love you, the Lord loves you, I am for you, and I never leave one of those meetings without offering an attempt at a next step. Thank you so much for your time today. I am more than willing to have coffee with you again if you want. Here's the only thing I would ask before that coffee. Hey, here's a book I will send you for free. Hey, here's a podcast I'd really love you. I do everything I can to try to show them that I'm still for them as a person, and separate the issue. I'm not, I'm not mad at you, Tom. I'm not mad at you, Tom. But I'm not going to deny the Lord on what the Lord says about this. And your, your issue, by the way, Tom, isn't with me. And it isn't with Grace Fellowship. It's with this. It's with the Bible. And if, if you want to get mad at me and blame me for that, you can. But I didn't write it. I didn't make it. It, it is what it is. And then, I, and then in this, what I try to just come back to over and over and over is the goodness of God. None of this stuff that's here is to ruin your life. It's because God knows you and he knows what's best for you. and He's a creator and he knows what's best for his creation. But the reason I wanted to take a few minutes to talk about these words is a lot of times, have you guys noticed how many words mean different things to different people anymore? Like I could, I've done this exercise before where I'll write up some words. I mean, we do it in the church all the time. I say everybody in the room write a definition of discipleship. Good luck. Now it's even moved into other words. Everybody in the room write a definition of what a vaccine is. Good luck. And so people say, I'm deconstructing. And what happens is we talk past them because we don't actually know the conversation that we're having. So I've just found this has been a helpful way to process this. All right, before I start to move to a few of these individually, any other thoughts or questions about this? I wasn't trying to be shallow with that. I'm just saying tell them the truth and then focus on who they are as a person and keep bringing them back. Keith, what's the difference between doubt and denial? Like, how do you define if somebody's doubting or, or denial? Yeah. That's a fine line. Yeah, I think, I think when they move from here to here is when they've moved from I'm wrestling with to it's wrong. It's not true. That can't be. Versus I, I just, I'm really struggling with how that can be and I don't understand. I'm not ready to say that it's wrong, but help me understand, help me process that out. You know, why, why do good things, bad things happen to good people? And you know, like, but I think the issue is when they, they cross the line of saying it, it, it's wrong, it is the way that it is. Not even I'm wrestling with could it be wrong.
mm -hmm. to bring it back to me. So in, the, in my way of trying to separate the person from the issue, he wants to bring the issue back to me as a person. That's what you believe. You believe the Bible is free from error. I believe the Bible has it. That's, that's great. Um, you, uh, you are right that I believe the Bible doesn't have errors. But I, there's lots of people that believe that. And if you want to take my word for it, I'm happy to give you these resources to have the conversation about it. But at the end of the day, this is a belief on faith. And this is what I believe by faith. And because of that, this wins. And there is just so much in this new culture right now that is just, they are um, redefining words and issues so they can make it say what they want it to say. They're, they're playing games. They're, they're pretending the narratives in the Bible. They're making minor narratives, major narratives, and all kinds of things. Okay, let's go through a few of these. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to jump around a little bit. But um, let me start with this one because it's really real. Probably exhibit A that a lot of us feel for this is travel sports, right? This is, this is huge. Um, many of us, uh, I, I've got a kid who played travel sports, and we had to navigate it. Um, uh, you can stand up and pound the pulpit and rage against travel sports all you want. You're going to lose. Um, I'm not saying you can't, and I'm not saying you shouldn't even say it's wrong. I'm not even saying you shouldn't have personal conversations where you call it out. What I would suggest is that you work really hard to tell people that you clearly think there should be lines, and then you empower them to be godly when the, they make the choices they make. So how do you coach them to... Um, do discipleship if they're going to travel? How do you coach them to say what lines can you draw? So I've tried to model that. Um, one of the rules I try to live in in pastoring is I do, I work very hard to not make myself the hero because I'm not and I make a ton of mistakes. I'm a flawed person. But when there are opportunities to say you get it right, try to tell them a few times you get it right, that you get it right. One of the things I've told them is my oldest, when he plays travel sports, um, he, there was a rule. He played travel soccer. He played travel basketball. Depending on the season that he was in, he was allowed to miss uh, one weekend per season where he was completely gone. Otherwise, he had to go to church somewhere that weekend. He had to. That was the rule. And if that wasn't going to be possible, he didn't go, get to go to that tournament. We told every coach he played for that rule at the beginning of the season. Coach Steve, my name's Keith. You actually have heard what I do for a living. You can probably understand Faith's really important. Church is really important. It's also important to my son, uh, and it's important to his mother and I. And so here's what I want you to let you know. Wherever you feel about Caden, if Caden can't live, if you can't have Caden on the team with these rules, then you probably shouldn't have him on the team. But here's the rules. The rule is he's got to go to church every weekend except one weekend of a sports year. Otherwise, he's not going to miss. He's not going to be able to play. Maybe he can play Saturday, but he can't play Sunday. That's the rule. Is that cool? Clear dialogue, clear conversation. It's also Caden. That's the rule. Shut up. That's the rule. Um, and we told him that. So I've told the church some version of that. Not because I want them to think we were right, but because I want to try to equip them to think of how to do it. Right? Then when we go on a trip, Caden, we're going to find a local church in the area. We're in this area. Let's go to this church. Let's do it. Hey, um, we try to explain to parents. Sometimes there's more time in between games than you think, and you could make it to another campus if you really wanted to do the work. Could you do that? What are the things that you're going to do? How are you going to drive spiritual conversation with your non-Christian friends? Blah, blah, blah. My oldest son, he, um, he always has this mindset with his travel sports teams that all he cares about is playing. He doesn't care about building relationships. He goes, does practice, gets back in the car, and goes home. And he was probably 13 and, or 14, and I said to him, Caden, you never engage the other kids. He said, Dad, I'm here to play sports. I don't really care. I said, no, 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 you're not. You are here sent by the Lord Jesus to be a witness and a light onto those kids so that you can tell them and show them the hope of who God is. And you're not going to do that running to practice, getting to practice, coming back in the car. You're going to find a way to invest in a relationship with them. Well, Dad, blah, blah, blah. No, 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 no. So disciple your kid in that moment to think about it. So... All that is to say, how do we disciple our people and our own families to make the most of this if they're going to do it? And to recognize and call out when parents are being ridiculous. So, so I just say this from the platform all the time. Your kid's not going to be a pro. Stop it. Stop it. One of the most common expressions I say at church all the time, no one will, uh, no one will lie to you about you more than you. 
You are the master of self-deception in your own life. And you are the master of self-deception with your own kids. They're not that good. They're not that good. If I can't walk in the gym and look and go, that kid's a college athlete, then he ain't a college athlete. It's a fact. He's just not. I, there, the, my town, where my main campus is, is super unique. We have two kids in the NBA right now from that town. We've had three kids in the NBA in the last 15 years, and we've had 11 NFL players in the last 15 years. It's ridiculous. And so sometimes when I say that, they yell at me. They're like, that's not true. We send kids to the NFL all the time. And I'm like, yeah, and your kid ain't that kid. <laughs> it is not. Like, stop. And so there is a level, like, where you have to sometimes sit people down and explain the money to them as well because they're telling themselves the narrative their kid's going to get a scholarship. And then you back up and you go, okay, even if your kid got a scholarship based on how much money you've invested, where would you? One of my best friends, kid of the guys at my wedding that I played basketball with at Cedarville, he, uh, his daughter is a Division I volleyball player, and she's incredible. She plays at Virginia Tech. She was player of the year in Division Three in the state of Ohio, took her team to state. She's amazing. Um, and I asked him one time, I said, hey, how much money will you have invested in her by the time she graduates, even if she gets a full ride? He said, two full years of college tuition. So she's going to college for free, but he already paid for two years of her college tuition at the front end before it even happened. So some of it is like, let's disciple them. Let's also talk about the money. Let's talk about reality. Let's talk about all that stuff. But can I also just tell you this? The reason your people are only coming to church 1.6 times a month is also not because of travel sports. It's just because they're lazy. It's because it's not been prioritized. It's because sometimes our church experiences haven't been super engaging. Um, it's because we haven't given them a vision. Um, yeah, so I could say more about that, but those are some things I would say about this. This, here's the number one expression I would say to you about tradition of some churches. This comes down to one single word. Leadership. If you want change, you have to lead change. Whoever you are is in that sentence. The statement that we stay around our staff is this. It's not that they won't, it's that we haven't yet led them. It's not that they won't, it's that we haven't yet led them. Will a Saturday night service work? Depends if you lead them to it. Will a Thursday night service work? Depends if you lead them to it. Will people go to other church services at different times? Depends if you lead them to it. Will they go to small groups? Do you lead them to that? Can you change that student ministry? Do you lead them to that? Most of the people in your church, most, not all, are ready to be led by leaders with a clear vision and direction and make it happen. And part of leadership is getting rid of the roadblocks of people who are stuck in tradition over mission. Um, we've been approached in my time at Grace by like seven different churches to have a potential merger. Like, hey, will you come take us over? Or we'd like to talk to you about you taking us over. Seven different times we've done it. We've gone down that path with seven different churches. We've had it happen with one. Three of the other times they broke up with us. Three of the other times we broke up with them. Almost every single time the problem that exists is that the church that is dying wants life but doesn't want to change. And they come and they want energy and help and young people and money and resources and direction. And then it's like, great, and these are the things that are going to have to change. Well, we don't want to change that stuff. Well, then you don't want to live. And you have to be willing to lead to that. Y'all should know this. Thriving leaders, what we're talking about. Leadership's hard. You got to pay prices. It's awful. People say things. You make calls that you, people don't like. And you got to do it. This is a leadership issue. And you got to be willing to lead sometimes people that have been there a long time. And listen, here, um, every organization has to answer four questions. All the time. What do I need to create? What do I need to fuel? What do I need to kill? What do I need to ignore? This is what leaders do. Is you sit around and you ask, what do I need to create? What do I need to fuel? What do I need to kill? What do I need to ignore? That's what you do. And sometimes you can ignore something and it'll die on its own. 
It just, you don't need to give it, it, just don't give it energy, don't give it money, don't talk about it, it'll go away on its own. It's fine. Sometimes you need to create the thing because if you don't have that thing, you can't move forward without creating it. Sometimes you have a thing that's going awesome, you need to pour gas on it so that you can be what you want to be. But sometimes you have to kill something. Now, whenever you kill it, here's the most important thing. Bury it with dignity. Bury it with dignity. Nobody was wrong on purpose. Nobody created it because they're a moron. There was actually a time where that thing was really, really good. So whatever you kill, bury it with dignity. Hey guys, we're getting rid of this thing, but man, it's had a 15 year run that's been really helpful. It's been beneficial. There's some really great things that have come from it. It's just the time to move on. But I'm so thankful for Alice who made that thing. It was great. It served us really, really well, but we're going to go on. And then you take it out back and you old yeller it. It's gone. It doesn't happen no more. Too many leaders won't do this work, and that's work. By the way, this is a really helpful template if you uh, take over a church, if you go to plan a church, you go to take over a ministry to ask yourself, what does that have to be? And good leaders are constantly doing this. They're constantly asking, what do you do, what do you do? But when you kill it, you have to build with their, bury it with dignity. And for some people, the reason churches are stuck it's because they won't get rid of the things they need to get rid of and they won't bear them with dignity and create it, all right? Um, okay, let's go to social media. Um, here's, again, this is one of the places where a lot of people blame my church is small, I can't do social media because my church is small, your church is big, you have people that can do it. No one has an excuse right now because of these two letters that exist in our culture now called AI. Do you know that you can insert your content into ChatGPT and it will create a voice for your church that will spit out what you need it to be? Everything from social media posts to marketing promotions to things for your website. So what do you do? You go to ChatGPT, you create a channel for your church. You get it to upload your sermons, your announcements, your content, your information. And over time, what ChatGPT will do is it will hear your language, your words, your approach. And then you can say, I need a social media post for this mission trip. And ChatGPT in six seconds will go, boop, done. You only need a person. Now, some of us go, scary, the robots are winning, we're in trouble, different conversation. But one of the things that we all need to learn to do in, in this day and age is you need to leverage this. This can, this can serve you in everything from social media to your website to the way you do announcements. The real discipline is creating the channel and uploading the information. I know churches that have done this for about a year and now they're, al they're almost fully dependent to be able to let ChatGPT spit back everything out of them because it understands their individual language so much. The words they would use, the values they would have, the things they would aspire to. Every sermon, they upload it. Every announcement, they upload it. They put all that content into your church's chat GPT. Okay. Um, um, bad is worse than not at all. If you can't do social media well, don't do it. Don't do it. Because if you think, well, I'm going to reach the next generation, and then you post social media like a person that doesn't understand social media, you're not reaching the next generation. You're repelling the next generation. If you don't know what you're doing, don't do it. If you want to get help, go ask for help and get people to do it. There are services that do this for cheap. Again, you can do it through AI. You can get a volunteer. There's probably a college student in your church or a high school student that would love to be empowered to do this and to do it well. But if you empower them, then let them do it. Um, this, you have to ask what your philosophy is it. So uh, there's, there's so much to go on this, but like, is your philosophy front yard or living room? So are you leveraging social media so that the world who doesn't go to my church sees it and they understand, oh, okay, that's what's there. I could be a part of that. Or is it for the people that are already in your church and you're trying to disciple it? Or is it both? Do you know? 
If I was to pull up anyone in this room's church's social media account and look at it, I would be able to tell really quickly whether or not you have a philosophy or not. If your only thing for social media is that you're just going to use it as a glorified bulletin or program, don't do it. Don't just use social media for information sharing. Don't. It's not... It's, my son and daughter are not going there for the information sharing. And my wife doesn't go. She's going to get it some other way. Um, this gets also into conversations about website for next generation. Website is your primary, um, I'll just call it front door. The majority of people who come to our church that are under the age of 35 have watched us online for at least a month before they come. So you have to decide what you're going to do with this and how this is going to look because it's where people are viewing you. It's how they're starting to decide who you're like and what you're like. There's a bunch more that could be said, but these are a few things to think about this. There's a ton of research, a ton of data. Some people over amp what it does or doesn't do. Um, you're not going to grow your church per se because you have great social media, but you can hurt your influence with poor social media. Some things I say about that. All right, one more. Okay, um, building a youth ministry. You, this is leadership and vision. You have to look at people and say, I, I can remember we were small. Again, 52 people my first week in a church. I used to teach the student ministry. It was like eight, seven kids, and then I would go preach. Um, Every single person that visited our church that was thinking about staying and they would give me the speech about, I don't know, we just got students and we want them to be in a great place. I would sit down with them and I would look them eyeball to eyeball. I understand. I get it. If I was in your shoes, I'd probably feel the way I did. But I need you and I'm asking you to come build something awesome with me. I'm, I'm, I need you and I'm asking. I would vision cast them. I know I can't give everything, but listen, here's what I If you do this, if you do this, this is what I'm telling you is going to happen. And you tell them the preferred future. And you tell them what it could be. And then, listen, this is so important. And then when fragments of that happen, you walk up to them and you hug them and you thank them. Thank you that you didn't leave Joan's family. Remember when it was just you and the Smiths? And now look, and instead of just like six of you, there was 20 kids we just took to that retreat. Thank you. Thank you. And that 20 kids is going to turn into 35 kids because you guys stayed. And we're going to be able to look back. And then what you do, listen, you, you thank them. And then you tell that story to other people. You know our youth ministry exists? Because the Joneses came here and there was nobody here and the Joneses stayed. Joneses are heroes. I love the Joneses. Then you go up and you give them a big hug. But you have to go vision cast those people. You can't compete with their toys, but you can compete with their relation, your relationship. So spend time with them, hang out with them, win them with all that stuff that you have. Take advantage of the fact that you're small. It's like, it's like being recruited at a giant school versus a small school. There's things you can say to them. That youth pastor's probably not even going to know your kid's name. I'm going to hang out with them anytime. I'm, I'm in. This is also where I would say that part of the way you can do this build the student ministry, is don't just rely on the youth people. Make it the leadership of the church's job. I'm in with you. I'm helping you. I want to come alongside you. I want to do this. We feel this all the time when we campus. We just launched a campus not long ago, and we sent like students from it, and they left a student ministry that had several hundred kids, and then they showed up, and there was like 30 of them. And you got a vision cast. You got a vision cast parents. It was the number one question I got an interest meetings from parents. What about my students when they go, do they have to leave this youth group? And I looked at them and I said, I can't make you do anything. But we would love if your student was in the student ministry where you attended church. And we need you to go there to help build it. So would you please take your student with you? And would you please cast the vision to your student about why this is so important? And people did. But you got to lead them and you got to give them vision. And a lot of us sort of just live in the like, if we build it, they will come. No, they won't. Lead them. It's not that they won't. It's that you haven't yet led them. And that shows up on a lot of places. I get calls and people are like, we have a Thursday night service at our main campus. And people will call me and they're like, we started a Thursday night service and it didn't work. 
And I'm like, did you lead your people or did you just start the service? All right, lunchtime. You got it? All right.
uh, we all know the post-lunch food stuffed coma feeling, but let's just try to uh, make the best of it. I'm going to really, my hope here is to present one thing that's a leadership-oriented thing, um, a thoughtful church-oriented thing, but it's really to go to your questions and say, what are some leadership challenges that you guys want to dialogue on on that? And we'll get after that for the rest of our time. Uh, but I, want, I, I do want you to think about something um, in regards to uh, your ministry uh, that you lead, particularly if you're a church leader, but I think it's helpful for all of us uh, to think about. If I was to draw these, this Venn diagram and label these three circles, and for lack of a, a maybe a better way to say it, uh, we'll call this circle Word of God. We'll call this circle Mission of God. And we'll call this circle the Movement of God. Uh, some would maybe make this an emphasis on doctrine. Some would maybe make this an emphasis on, uh, we might even call this like an attractional driven church. And I'm going to use a word here that I know is loaded. But just for argument's sake, let's just call this charismatic. And I don't mean uh, heretically charismatic, but let's just say charismatic for a second. If I was to say who's the star of the show, uh, sort of from the trinity in these three things, we would often say this is the Father, this is the Spirit, and this is the Son. And then if I was to say, okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to tell me churches are leaders that when you think of their church, they fall in this category. I want you to think of churches and leaders that fall primarily into this category. Churches are leaders that fall into this category. So I'll go ahead and go first and, you know, kind of crucify myself with some names and you guys can disagree later. But like, we probably think of like Mac MacArthur, right? Like we, we go John MacArthur, he's high doctrine, that's where we land, that's kind of what we think about, right? If we go over here and we go mission of God, attractional, we might think North Point. Andy Stanley, maybe. Maybe for some of us we go. Then we go down here and some of us probably think Potter's House, T.D. Jake, something like that, right? And then if I was to say, what I want you to do is I want you to make a list of all the strengths of the churches that exist here. And you would say things like high view of Bible, high commitment to orthodoxy, high commitment to preaching that's from the scriptures, like all those kind of things, right? And then over here you would go, these people act like hell is real. They're trying to reach people, evangelistic culture, outreach, contextualization. Here you would go, man, these are the people I want to pray for me. <laughs> these are people high faith, believe God's at work, whatever. And then I say, okay, um, now list all the negative. What's the problem? Oh, they're angry. <laughs> <laughs> cynical, you know, they don't feel very loving, feels judgmental. Over here, you might say, yeah, they're wishy-washy, they're soft on doctrine, uh, their, their view of the Bible's too low. Here, you would say, I don't know, they're crazy. I, I, don't, I don't know if they're serious about the Word of God. You know, functionally, what we come back to with these groups is we get worried about apostasy here. Down here, we get worried about heresy. And up here, we get worried about hypocrisy. Right? Like That's kind of where we go, positives, negatives. Right? Start to think about, you could do this. I actually recommend you do this with some of your leaders. What are the strengths? What are the weaknesses? What are the churches? What, you know, so you start to do it. Then you go, okay, let's nuance it a little bit. And who are the churches and leaders that fall in here? So they're high doctrine but high mission. Some of us would probably go, maybe Life Church, maybe Craig Rochelle, maybe the Village Church, Matt Chandler, uh, maybe J.D. Greer's Church, the Summit. We start to maybe, maybe do that. Okay, then you go, okay, high mission, high spirit. Maybe Elevation, Furtick. You know, you, you could start to put some names to what you think. This is an interesting one. High doctrine, high spirit. There's actually one in Columbus that's really big, the Vineyard. Cooper Road Vineyard, which is a really big church in central Ohio. Rich Nathan used to be the pastor. He's transitioned. But they would be very high doctrine. He was a great preacher, 
very committed to the word, but also big in terms of gifts of the spirit and things that went on. And so we would do the same thing. Strengths and weaknesses, all that kind of stuff, whatever, whatever. Okay, and you list them out. Okay, now, here's what, here's what then you have to have to do. Where's your church? Where's your church? Now everybody wants to say you're right here. That's what you want to say. Where's your church? And everybody wants to say this, but you're not. <laughs> We're not. I did this exercise with my elders. I did it with my senior staff. And we said, we're, we're, we live here. And we just came back. And he, I came back from my sabbatical a few years ago. And here's what I said. And I'm going to connect this to young adults. And then I'm going to connect this to leadership. And then we're going to go to questions, OK? Um, I came back. And here's what I told the, the, the elder board. I said, far too often, guys, I lead the church like our battle is against flesh and blood. And it's not. And I said, far too often, we act like we don't have spiritual problems when we really have spiritual problems. And what I said was, we have to figure out as a church, and I have to figure out as a leader, how to move this in this direction. And you may go, great, that's a good idea. And then, then how? How? What does that look like? What's it look like within orthodoxy? What's it look like? How do you, how do, you do that? How do you talk about that? How do your prayers change? How does, that, how does that go on? Like, how does all of that play out, right? And so we just said, and we've been on about a two and a half year journey of saying, we're a really good church that lives right here, but we've got to figure out how to move this way, and we've got to figure out how to make this a bigger deal in our life, and we've got to get after it. Now, why, why do I say that? Come back to leadership and um, reach the next generation. Let me tell you something you already know, but if I don't say it, I won't be able to look myself in the mirror. The biggest way that all of this happens is that the Spirit of God moves. And we have to all ask the Spirit of God to move and pray. So I, I spent an hour and a half talking about a bunch of strategies and wrote up a bunch of things, but I didn't say it this morning, but I'm saying it now, and none of that happens without the Spirit of God showing up and moving. We say in our staff all the time, we talk about the, the Proverbs 21, 31. Prepare the horse for battle, but victory belongs to the Lord. Prepare the horse for battle, but victory belongs to the Lord. There's two parts to that verse. There's the human side, there's the divine side. There's the humans prepare the horse for battle. The victory belongs to the Lord is the God side. I spent the morning talking about preparing the horse for the battle. What I'm talking about right now is that victory belongs to the Lord and he has to show up and do it. And we should never expect answers to prayers we never prayed. And if we're truly going to solve a lot of this stuff and figure it out and get after it and whatever, what I'm going to have to tell you, and I just, I mean this, for some of us, our Trinity is Father, Son, and Holy Bible. And we have written the Holy Spirit out of the picture. And this is complicated. It's messy. We could probably start some pretty good fights in here today with what we do and how we do it and what it looks like and how it plays out and what's in bounds and what's out of bounds. And I don't know, but my Bible says that if I'm going to produce fruit with the Spirit, I have to learn to walk in step with the Spirit. My Bible says that apart from Jesus, I can do nothing. I have to remain in God. I have to stay with God. It says I'm supposed to walk with the Spirit on a daily basis. So I better figure out how to lead my church and get after this. I also want to be careful that some of us don't say we're doing it because we're just doing spiritual activities, but we're actually not having the Spirit be a part of those. You know you can have a prayer meeting that's actually not about the Spirit at all? Depending on how you go about it and what plays out. And, what we, and when we start talking about asking the Spirit to lead and guide and direct, that's messy and it's hands up. And, you know, but all that, prepare the horse for battle, victory belongs to the Lord, Proverbs 21, 31. The victory belongs to the Lord and... I would first say, as a leader, where are you at in this? Your church, your ministry, your whatever, your personality, your personal walk with the Lord. But for us as a church, we've got to figure out how to move this down. And this has dramatic impact to showing young adults and the next generation that the, that the relationship we have with God is not purely mechanical or pragmatic. It's spiritual. And I have a lot more I can say about that than I can um, pragmatically give you on how to make that happen. But I know it's true. And I know it's true in my own life. And I know um, 
learning to talk to people about your following of the Spirit in a way that doesn't spook them out but disciples them and is real is tough. And this endeavor to reach the next generation is a spiritual endeavor. Um, you know, it's a, it's a metaphor. It's not the point of the text, but I think you get this. You guys remember the story, demon-possessed boy, disciples can't heal him. They brought him to the disciples. Disciples can't do it. Jesus says, how long am I going to be with you, O oh, unbelieving generation? They leave, and they say, what, what, what happened? And he's like, bozos, this one comes out by prayer. Now, I don't know how the other ones came out. But this one comes out by prayer. Something about the depth of that spirit and that spirit was even more supernaturally supernatural. I want to suggest that where our culture is right now, it ain't going to come out except by prayer. We are going to have to fight a spiritual battle in a spiritual way. I know that's odd. I know what is that? Mean? I'm just telling you, for me and my church, we got to figure out how to do this. I don't know about your church. Maybe you're great at that and you're terrible at mission. Maybe you're great at mission and you've got lots of prayer and lots of faith and all that stuff, but you're a doctor. I don't know. But look at that. I think it's a really important leadership exercise. I think it's important. We did this as an elder board. We did it as an executive staff. We walked through it. We talked about it. Then we then talked about pragmatically how do we get after this? What does this look like? How does this play out? We've tried to do it. It actually has affected the way I pray in front of the church to try to model prayers beyond uh, suburban safety and security. <laughs> or transitional prayers simply to get the band out. It doesn't mean we don't bring the band out. We do, but how do we pray? And what, what, what are we talking about? What's, what's going on? So uh, I just want to put this in front of you as a leadership principle, as a thing to think about, but also in our connection to the youth of the next generation to say, are you really praying in a very specific way that God would move uniquely in that generation and with specific things about it? Um, Tim had mentioned like the idea of, of mental health. Um, one of the things I just think is, is interesting about this is um, when everybody is something, then nobody is that. So uh, years ago, there was this move. You guys, some of you are old enough to remember uh, was, it, was it Keith Green who told us we all had to go to the mission field and nobody should stay? We all were called to go. And everybody needed to go to the mission field. And there was this big move in the mission field. Then the 80s came along. And in the middle of the 80s and the early 90s, we said, nope, everybody's a missionary. Everybody's a missionary because you're a missionary if you're a school teacher and you're a missionary if you're a police officer and you're a missionary if you're a firefighter. And the byproduct that nobody wanted admitted was we devalued the idea of sending people globally overseas because if everybody's a missionary, then nobody's really a missionary and we don't actually call people to be missionaries. And we've struggled with that for a long, long time in the missions movement. Lots written on it. Here's my point, and this will probably makes people mad. If everybody's depressed, nobody's really depressed. If everybody has anxiety, nobody really has anxiety. We are calling terms terms that are actually devaluing the real people who have those problems. So when people who are young adults come to us and they say, I have anxiety, I'm anxious, we have to learn to graciously walk alongside them to help them understand, actually, anxiety is a normal part of the way God designed you. There's actually healthy realities to anxiety. Anxiety helps you know to run away from a bear. Anxiety helps you to jump your cortisol levels to study for a test so that you'll do better on it. Anxiety helps you to be nervous around slippery things. Anxiety is not all bad. You have to differentiate what is your normal life and stress from a chronic mental health illness. And we are allowing everybody right now to be labeled in a mental health crisis that's not true. If everyone's sick, nobody's sick. And the problem is when someone like me says that, what people hear is, you're going to keep stigmatizing the problem. I would actually say the opposite is happening. We are not actually treating the people who have the real problem because we're telling everybody they have the problem. Everybody's not anxious. Everybody's not depressed. Everybody's not. But also the power of telling someone over and over and over, you, maybe you're anxious. 
Maybe you're depressed. And some of it is we need to come back and go, hey, what does God say about these things? God says there's some answers to anxiety that are not what we're hearing. There's some, there's some spiritual remedies to some realities you're experiencing. Um, I'm amazed when I actually sit down and have coffee sometimes with some of our people who are saying they're dealing with mental health and we process for 40 minutes and we come on the other side of it. They're not anxious about, they don't have anxiety. They have anxiousness about a situation. They have low emotional intelligence. They've never grown up. Uh, you guys, there's so much written about delayed adulthood. It's contributing to these things in huge, huge ways, right? Um, uh, hey, some of you as parents, um, don't bail, let them fail. Stop bailing our kids out of things. Make them deal with adversity. Make them go through it. When my kids call me and say they forget their books at home, I say, sorry. I guess you want to have your book today. Dad! You're 18. You drove a car there. <laughs> my math book's not your problem. My pro your math book's not my problem. I'm going to teach you to have to navigate that. My son, will, uh, Dad, I want... Will you talk to them? No, you'll talk to them. I think some of this is the anxiety, the mental health thing. We've got to really figure out how to help them practically, but then also bring it back to this. All right, leadership questions. Let's spend the rest of the time on this. What are some leadership things in your ministry, in your sphere, in your world, you're navigating, dealing with, and you want to process and maybe talk about or ask a specific question on? Could be leadership development. Could be staff, could be uh, anything. What, what in your world, leadership-wise, are you trying to process and deal with? Yeah. So one of the things is I'm going to I'm going to teach my leaders of any ministry area to be thinking that same way so that within their ministry they're thinking about that I'm not thinking about that they're thinking about that. For me and back in the day like when it was growing we were small and moving forward or when we do something like okay, I'm going to ignore things that have minimal sideways energy and virtually no consequence of letting them go. So these eight ladies want to have a knitting ministry. They hang out. It's not in the program. It's not costing us any money. It's not, I'm not going to go kill the knitting ministry. It's just going to die. Right? I get, so minimal sideways energy and minimal impact on anything else. And it, I'm actually probably going to lose chips by hurting it. Right, so um, kill. If we don't hurt this, it's going, if we don't get rid of this, it's gonna keep us from becoming what we need to become. It's not only bad energy, it's bad for our culture, it's bad resources, it's reinforcing DNA and habits we don't want. And so like, it, it must be uprooted or we can't move forward. Like it's, it's contributing to things we do not want long term. It's gotta go away. It's not minimal. It's, it's like it's contributing. It's getting in the water, so to speak. Um, create. We know this is where we want to go and what we do. And if we don't build it, there's no way we have a chance. So we have to create it. it we can't take the next step we need to take in the bell curve if we don't do this. And we don't have it. So we got to create it. Fuel. Fuel. This is helping our bell curve go in the right direction. It's reinforcing all the things that we want. And what it needs is more airtime, more money, more resources, more support, more training, staff, whatever. 
but it's, it is building what we need it to build. So at a high level, I'm looking going, okay, our discipleship culture. And our discipleship culture, what's there in all those things? What's, what are we doing? Okay, you know what we're doing? We went from single leadership to shared leadership, and we are seeing an explosiveness of benefit of that in our small group ministry through shared leadership. How do we put fuel on that? How do we train that? How do we launch more groups with that? How do we reproduce more with that? How do we go after that, right? I could keep going. But like that, that's in the mechanics in my head. No, those are going to show up a lot of times. Like for me, um, they might show up in the way that I'm creating the agenda for the elder board, the executive team. Um, they might show up in ways that I'm managing my, uh, my, the staff that report to me in terms of my one-on-ones with them. It's, I think it's more, it's, it's less about like, you know, Thursday at two is the time I do this and more about just making it a part of the way you breathe but you're just walking around thinking about that. And you see it. Like you see on weekends, you'll go, like on a week you don't preach, walk around and look and go, like what's contributing sideways energy here? What's not the way we want it? Oh my gosh, that is giving so much life to our weekend. How do we put fuel on that? It's, I don't know, it's, it's hard a little bit, Jordan, because I think it's just something I'm doing. I identified five things where you were talking yeah. about. Yeah, so. yeah. Other leadership things. You're thinking through. Yeah, John. Yeah, you see, uh, Jim and I are having conversations with Jeff today. You know, you've been at the church now for 20 years. Uh, like yep, going to be soon, yep. Yeah, how, how do you, how have you kept yourself fresh, not stale? How are you getting ready for the next season of ministry? Or maybe, maybe, maybe you don't, maybe you don't. You know, but how do you work? I'm, I'm stale and tired, John, so <laughs> no. Yeah, I mean, leadership, and particularly ministry leadership, we have to acknowledge that we are pouring a lot out, right? Like, we are content generators, content givers. I mean, I led an elder board meeting Monday. I led a um, very important executive team meeting on Tuesday. I'm speaking today. I will preach tomorrow. I have a podcast after this I'm doing. I have another podcast on Friday. Uh, and then I'm leading a mission team meeting on Sunday that I have to create all that for. Um, the, the, the biggest thing I can say is you, you can't give what you don't have. So you have to constantly fill your bucket. I don't go a single week without listening to two other sermons. I'm always reading a book. I read. I, I, my goal is always to read 15 minutes a day, listen to two sermons a week. And then I'm, I'm podcasting. And... You're doing it, right? You're doing it while you're on the treadmill. You're doing it while you're walking the dog. You're doing it while you're driving. Like I drove three and a half hours here last night. I listened to three podcasts, right? Like I'm, I'm not wasting time with that stuff, but I'm always replenishing, okay? Then for me, I'm always saying in different areas of my ministry, I'm always saying I have like one thing I want to get better at. So I've, right now in preaching, I have one specific thing I want to get better at. And leading the board, I have one specific thing I want to get better at. And I'll run after that for a season until I feel like I've knocked it out, and then I'll move. Um, I listen to different voices. I listen to lots of people preach that I don't agree with. But I want to see their cadences, their rhythms, their, their, their different things, right? Like, um, I, so I put a lot of content in front of me. I listen to a lot of content. I try to be personally disciplined. And then... Um, I'm a big believer in the difference between, uh, number one question I've gotten asked over the years, how do you keep balance in your life? I tell people all the time, balance is a myth. It's not real. It's impossible. What you can do is rhythms and know what season you're in. And whatever season you're in, I capitalize on. If I'm on vacation, I'm on vacation. If I'm off, I'm off. If I'm on sabbatical, I'm on sabbatical. But if I'm at work, I'm at work. People would be surprised how potentially ungracious people might think I am to my own family. 
When I'm at work, I'm at work. When I'm at home, I'm at home. I've preached for 20 years. I've worked on messages outside of work less than 10 times. I don't work on them at home. I work on them at work. I work on work at work. When I go home, home. Text comes up, you got to respond. That's, you, know, I'm not, you know what I'm talking about, focus time. So one of the ways I stay fresh is where I'm at, I'm at. When I'm on vacation, I'm on vacation. I, I, if I'm on a mission trip, I'm on a mission trip. Like, I work really hard to do that. And then I work really hard in the season we're in to capitalize on the season, right? Christmas time and Easter time, they're awful for us. But other times are better for us. So I capitalize on my family with that. We're, we're in the middle of building a 30,000 square foot addition to our main campus right now, right? $10, $11 million project, got to raise money, got to talk to leaders, got to do it. There's construction outside. It's a mess. It's terrible. It's not fun. And it'll get really bad as it gets closer, right? And so I look at my kids in those moments and I go, the next month's terrible, guys. But the month after that, we'll go to Great Wolf Lodge. We'll do this. We'll do this. Here's what's the other side of that. This season, that season, capitalize, right? Um, I try to be really honest about evaluating my preaching. Every Thursday after service, whoever preaches at our main campus, there is a meeting in my office that is an evaluation, whoever it is, including me. Every week. Doesn't matter who preaches. So how are you getting better? What does that look like? Like to try to keep fresh. And then here, here's, here's honestly, and this is, this is not going to be a secret to your guys, but the best way to stay excited about ministry is to have a ministry you're excited about. Reach people. Eight families from my street came to Christmas Eve. I got all the fuel I need. Three of them are Christians, five of them aren't. Three of them are coming regularly, five of them are teetering. And I got pushed on that because the person who was driving that the most was my daughter. And my daughter got on fire evangelistically, and she, I started looking, I was like, I need to keep up. So, like, I'm excited about my church, which makes me excited to keep my job and do what I'm doing, right? The moment I don't want to go to my church, I'll resign. I don't want to be there. I tell my staff that all the time. If you wouldn't attend here if you didn't work here, don't work here. Don't work here. It's too important. It's too significant. And it's, it's too hard. So those are some things, you know. And then, of course, my personal life. I really love Jesus, John. I really do. I think sometimes people think if you're a good professional, like, you quit loving Jesus. Like, I really love Jesus and I'm grateful that he paid for my sin. That makes me really excited about my job. I get, I get paid to be a professional Christian. That's unreal. And in my context, I get paid a good amount of money to do it. Like, it's great. I, I, I don't get real tired of that. No, it's hard. I got a terrible situation with some things back home right now at church. I mean, I'm missing, like, an exact communication that went out to my elder board while I'm standing here. It's terrible. There's a thing blowing up. And it's stressful, and it's awful, and it's tiring. But I do all those things I just said. Yeah. What else? Yeah. One of the struggles I have, especially like, um, is balancing like the professionalism, like creating a good product or whatever, like you know, good content, all that stuff. Balancing like spending time investing in, in people. And is there how do you, how do you kind of manage that, or how would you suggest that? Like, <sighs> yeah, it's it's hard. Um, I don't know, like what Jim would say in his context, but for me. Um, my job description's changed a lot since I've got there. And functionally, I'm not a pastor. I'm a pastor, but I'm not a pastor. The amount of people that I personally shepherd is small. And so it's, I'm probably not a great person to ask for that because it's not my job description. I have to lead the staff. I have to lead the elder board. And then I have other things that are in my specific job. But I don't, it's not because I can't, I don't want to, but like, I don't do a lot of weddings anymore. I don't do a lot of counseling anymore. I don't, I don't, some, I did one yesterday, but I don't do a lot of that anymore because we have staff and team and all that. And so um, what I would say, though, is this. I heard a person say a long time ago, they said, no matter where you end up, though, in sort of the org chart, if you stop smelling like sheep, you should be nervous. 
And so I always ask myself, am I smelling like sheep? And I know when I'm not. And I, and I would say one of the dangers in a person like my job and the bigger your church gets in your role is you can get so far away from people you stopped influencing them. And so we've tried to like even do that, reconstruct that. So here's, here's an example. It's a great one. Steal this. It's worth the trip. Um, once a month on Thursday night before church, um, I have dinner with five to seven families at the church building. We offer them three menu items. My assistant organizes it all. She organizes them from all our campus. I have no idea who's going to be there. She hands me an envelope. Before I walk out of my office, it has the names of the people from my office to the building. I find out who's going to be there. I go there, and I start the meeting at 515. It has to end at 645 because I have to preach at 7. I do it once a month on Thursday nights, and I ask them three questions. How can we better serve you? What do you want to know about our future? How can I pray for you? I've done it for two years now, met with like 200 people, five to seven families at a time, one Thursday a month. It's awesome. And they love it, and it builds trust, and it's great, and I knock out the equivalent of five to seven breakfasts in an hour and 20 minutes. And I have to be done because I have to go preach. And they all love it, and it's great, and they get access to me, and it's super beneficial, and I hear their hearts. And, they, and, and to be honest, some of them are like really life-giving, and some of them aren't awesome. But they're all awesome because they're all with the people. And so I heard a pastor, Steve Stroop, pastor of a giant church in Dallas, Texas. He started doing that years ago. I was at a thing like this where he talked about that. I was at the table. I wrote that idea down. I went back and said, elders, I think I want to do this. They said, great. I said, do it for a year. I did it for a year. I came back. I reported on it. They said, do it for another year. I'm in year two. It's awesome. That's the way I smell like sheep. Right? I go to the men's retreat. I lead a table. I smell like sheep. Find ways like that. Other leadership things you're processing, thinking about. I'm processing the feedback loop. We've got a feedback loop at our church and they've been preaching once yep. a week. We have a meeting. Yep. What are some other things that you do feedback with? How regularly and, and what are your basic questions? Yeah, so uh, uh, um, I think the biggest thing to healthy feedback loops is a culture that says feedback is normal. So I think one of the reasons that a lot of churches don't have good feedback loops is um, they haven't created an expectation that there will be feedback and that you are not your idea, so it's okay. Everybody can do it. Um, we do regular job reviews. Those are a form of feedback. Those have taken lots of different manifestations. Um, we have lots of postmortem over big things. Christmas Eve, Easter, camps, retreats. We're going to post-mortem and give feedback about that kind of stuff. Um, there's a lot of people that on their own have just said, like, if they let lead something they didn't do. But, oh, we have a weekly survey that a number of people on our weekend services team that they fill out every week. It comes right out, same week, same, it's the same 12 questions. They go out every single week. You do that. It's another feedback loop for things how we're doing. Um, but here's, here's, so those are some practical ways, Tim. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah, but here's a big thing. So um, you have to ask yourself, are you a how versus wow person, and what is your culture of your staff with this? So um, everyone in the room has a disposition that if your wife showed up tonight and said, honey, I think we should build a deck. All the how people are going to go, well, how big a deck? How much? Who's building it? When are we building it? What's it going to look like? What's the design of it? You're going to ask all the how questions. The wow people are going to go, honey, I love that you think about our home. I love that you think about hosting. I love that you want to have people over here. Tell me all the dreams that you want to do for the deck, okay? If you are a how person, when people come to you with feedback and questions, you will soon shut down all the wow people in your ministry. All, what happens is how people are, um, they take the wow people and they how them to death. Right? So, so what happens is the wow people just go, I'm not going to talk to the pastor so-and-so. 
He's going to ask me all the how questions. Where are we getting the budget? And how are we reviewing if it wins? And what happened? And who's going to do it? And who's doing security? And blah, blah, blah. And he's like, you know what? I'm not asking any of that stuff. So here's what we've said. Here's what we said. When people come and tell you an idea, your first discipline is to put your hands out under the table and go, wow. <laughs> and I hate it. Because I'm a how person. And there are times where people have come in my office where they tell me the idea, and I'm like, this isn't going to work. I know it's not going to work. I can tell them why it's not going to work right now. And I am learning just to shut up and go, wow. Because if you let the wow person feel valuable long enough, they'll bring you a great idea at some point. But if you how them to death, you'll shut them down. And some of you in this room who are super how people, you've shut down some of your best idea generators because as soon as they bring you an idea, you how it to death. And you're, I know you're, if you're a how person, you're like, but the how's important, Keith. <laughs> I know. I know it's important. I get it. But you, you got you to stop and let this happen. So part of the like, feedback is not just like the back end. It's even the front end of ideas. And we all have to learn how to do this way better, a lot of us who lead and feel responsible. Um, and, and wow people also need to realize that like sometimes your idea is stupid because we can't land a spaceship. So stop bringing me ideas about spaceships. Like stop, like you're wasting everyone's time. Um, but th this is big and Tim this has been big for me because I early on was shutting a lot of people down because I would just go to this right away. You, the, how do you help them realize they need to think about yeah, I mean, the, the how side? You're on a board and, and you're, you're sitting there and, and there's a lot of good ideas that might yep. come. But I see that concept yep. in, in this situation and, and how do you not, because you know, we, we, our board, a lot of us carry a lot of hats. Yep. And so therefore, we can't afford yeah, you, to, to lose any, even though there might be a how. Yep, yep, yeah. And you can't afford sometimes to have hours of meetings go by because people are just pontificating with nonsense. Um, I see that hard. Yeah, it is. And, and sometimes, it, sometimes it's the leadership of the framing of the conversation. You know, sometimes it's at the front end going, um, hey, we're going to take ideas on this. But I'm going to ask that before you share your idea, that you've done some mental math to say, is it actually possible? And then when they say the idea that's not mentally possible, everybody in the room's like, they're the idiot. We know that. Like, but it also forces the person to go, have I thought about that? Have I done that? Um, sometimes I have a board member. I have a, one of my elder board members. He is, he's an engineer by training. And he's a, he's a how guy to the nth degree. He's the like, hey, we're going to build a building. And he's like, what color is the carpet? <laughs> and like, I've had to meet with him personally and say, you are stifling our meetings. We can't be who we need to be because you're doing this over and over. And do, do you see that? I do. Do you agree? Yeah. Hey, in your engineering world, that's awesome. That's awesome. It can't happen over here. Um, the same thing is true um, with, uh, I'll just call them aesthetic people or art people versus regulatory people. So this is your um, facilities engineer guy, and this is your decor person. This is your youth ministry person who wants to do like a game with ramen noodles. And this is the custodial staff. This is the accounting department and the discipleship guy who says, I don't care about receipts. And they both have to realize they're both necessary. But you also have to help them understand you are not the dog, you're the tail. So here's an example. Um, I remember one time we were we were planning an element in service and the 
ops team came to us and said, you need to do it at this part of service because it'll be easier to clean up. And I said to them, respectfully, I don't care when it's easier to clean up. What I care about is where does it go that's going to make the most amount of sense to reach the most amount of people with the most amount of effectiveness. And we'll do the work to clean it up accordingly. If you let regulatory people drive your aesthetics and your art, it's going to be bad. But if the art and aesthetics people don't recognize that there are a thing called budgets, it's going to be bad. They're both necessary. You just have to have them in the right spot. And here's the problem with a lot of boards. A lot of boards have too many regulatory people. They're brake tappers. You don't want much more than two brake tappers per board. They're bad. They're necessary. But if you got a bunch of brake tappers, you'll never go anywhere. So you got to plan and lead accordingly with the people that are on your board. I have one strong brake tapper on my board. And he knows it. And, and it's, it's hilarious. He's been an elder for a long time. Our room knows when he's about to do what he does. They can sense it. They're like, you almost hear like a murmuring. Here it comes. And we love him. And, he, and, they're, and ke well, here, he's kept us from stepping in it. He has. But you just, this is a tough tension to manage. And you got to get rid of some of these folks. You need these folks. You want your lawyers and attorneys and your <laughs> compliance people to be this. But they can't drive the planning of your ministry stuff. Steve, can, can I flip it on you? I yeah. Mean, you're, you're a pastor. You're, you're in this. I guess I would ask you like what you see and what your struggles are and how you're working through some of those things when you're not in a group of people like this, being able to kick tires and you're by yourself. You're trying to figure out, like, hey, where are my blind spots and what I'm supposed to be doing. Uh, like for me personally in all this, oh my gosh. Um, I mean, one of the biggest, this is going to, this is going to sound like a cop out, but it's not. But like one of the biggest protectors of my blind spots is my wife. She's just, Kelly's just not impressed with me. She, she's known me. She knew, you know, like, so Kelly, Kelly's just super transparent and honest with me about things. My brother's one of our elders. He's not impressed with me. Um, some of it is like, I don't mean this, but like, I know who I am before the Lord in terms of my sin, and I've got to repent and deal with that. Um, and I've, I've got to navigate that. I think what I've really tried to lean into, Jordan, is I've tried to say, I'm going to be the best version of me that I can be and not try to be someone else. And with that comes a lot of things that I'm not going to be great at. But there's also some things that with me I can be really great at. And so I think part of that is like sometimes there's not blind spots as much as there's just legitimate weaknesses. Like I, I, I can't do certain things the way other people can do them. Um, and then there's also other things I have capacity at that I don't apologize for. Like... I get asked this question all the time. How long does it take you to write a talk? I can write a talk really fast. I have a really great memory. I recall things really quickly. And that ability to be able to do that frees me up to do some other things. Um, I've given my elder board carte blanche position to tell me when I'm an idiot and I'm wrong and I'm off. And I've surrounded myself with guys, not all of them, but most of them who do. Um, uh, I've made some huge mistakes I've had to own. And one of the things I learned was um, if you own your failures and your blind spots and your mistakes, uh, you still can go on. So it's just okay to do it. Um, I've had to go back after elder board meetings and call them all man by man and say, the way I said that in that meeting last night was completely out of pocket and I need your forgiveness. And I've had to do it. Um, yeah, I mean, I also know this. <laughs> LeBron James should never take credit for how tall he is. I should never take credit for the best gifts that I have that I didn't do anything to earn. It's the whole Deuteronomy 8. Like, 
Where did you get your ability to produce wealth? It came from the Lord. There's a lot of things that make me have a high capacity I did nothing to do. And I'm just really aware of that. Like, annoyingly aware in the sense that I just know I can't take credit for it. I heard a person say one time, um, you know, if you listen to everyone who thinks you're great, you'll have an ego. If you listen to everybody who thinks you're terrible, you'll be suicidal. So my choice was learn from all but be defined by God. That's the mantra I try, mantra I try to live by. Um, but I, I put people around me that can tell me the truth. I try to look at myself with sobriety. Um, I try to admit my failures. And then I just try not to do what I'm not awesome at. And I'm not awesome at this stuff. Like this stuff. I don't want to be anywhere near it. I literally, when they start talking about budgets, I ask the question, what's the minimum amount I need to know? <laughs> I don't want to be in the room. I don't care. I mean, I, I care because I'm responsible, but I don't care. I don't, they run the whole budget process. I don't, I'm not anywhere near it. I see when we hit total. And then I decide what I'm going to have to lead to that. And I trust the ministry people to figure those things out inside of it. But I don't know if I'm answering your question, man. It's, um, I try to personally be humble and try to let people tell me the truth around me. And there's been some really gracious people that have done that, including, again, my wife. Yeah. So I'm guessing when it gets small, you didn't have the ability. You were, you were involved in the budget. Totally, totally. Well, I, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I knew it all along. I just couldn't early on. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a little bit, some of you have heard, like, if they can do it 80% as good as you, let it go. Maybe you've not heard that, but the whole, like, if somebody can do something as 80% as good as you, and it's not going to, like, impact the overall mission terribly, let it go. It was that. Um, as soon as I knew I was able to hire people that were more talented than me at things, as soon as I could surround myself with that. Um, but there were things I knew early on I, I wanted to get away from me, and as soon as I could, I did. Um, so it, do you know what those are? Have you understood those? And then what's your plan like to try to do that? And um, there were different points, price points, staffing points, capacity points. Um, I've mentioned I have a really good memory. So literally, until we were about 1,200 people, I could preach and do attendance. Like I'd preach and I'd be like, they're not here, they're not here, they're not here. And I'd, do it and I'd, make, I'd, leave, the, I'd leave the platform and I'd go to my office and I'd get on a note card and I'd write all the names of the people that weren't there. And I, that's who I knew to follow up with that week that I would go after. And I knew their names and their husbands' names, their wives' names, their kids' names, dogs' names. I knew all of it. We got to 1,200. We were meeting at a big high school. And I couldn't do it anymore. I remember the Sunday. I preached. I looked out. And I'm like, I can't do it. I went to the elders, and I said to the elders, I have to quit. And they said, why do you have to quit? I said, because I can't know everybody anymore. It's too big for me. I can't get my arms around it. And they were like, hold on. And they talked. And, we went. and what I felt was, I, I have to be the one to shepherd and know everything, or else I can't do it. And they were like, there's a different way to skin this cat. Let's talk about this and get after So it was that week where, like, we started planning, like, how does Keith let go of some of that burden? So some of it's pressure points, some of it's gifting, some of it's money, some of it's time. Some of it, if you're well led by your elders, they'll tell you. I've, I've had the elders tell me, I, I love global missions. If I wasn't a pastor, I'd probably be overseas. I lived six months of my life in Cambodia. I love it. I was super involved in our global missions process. Ton of stuff. Elders came to me and they said, you can't be involved in it anymore. Not you can't go, but you can't be involved in the vision, direction, philosophy, any of that stuff. You're out of it. Too many other things you have to do. And it hurt. They were right. So I, I mean, that one was I got told. <laughs> and they're my boss. So I, okay. It's all that. You know, what are you currently doing that if you were like, I could get rid of this and I would still be better, how, I, I'll do this. Here's the other thing I'll say with that, especially small churches. People do not ask enough of volunteers. 
the local soccer program has no problem asking a lot of its volunteers. No problem. And we, we are so confused in ministry that we think we are burdening them when we are asking to bless them. Do not apologize for asking people to step into your ministry. One of the things I would say we got right early on was even when we were 50 people, we raised the bar of volunteerism. We said we do not want warm bodies. We want people that are mission ambassadors who are going to come in and get after this. And if that's not you, then don't serve. So I think one of the things is you can get way more done with volunteers than want. I regret we hired too many people too soon. We took ministry away from volunteers. If I could do it over again and go back, there are several jobs I would not have hired. I would have kept volunteers at. Two, there's great people in your church that want to do stuff if you'll ask them. It's one of my biggest frustrations with my staff. They won't ask volunteers enough. My wife thinks I'm crazy. She's like, you'll ask anybody anything. I'm like, yep. I don't care. What, what are they going to do? Say no. Call them to it. My first, of my first six hires, five of them were people that had been called to high-level volunteering that worked themselves into jobs. They were high-level volunteers that crushed it for us, that ended up getting hired. And three of them are still on staff, like 16 years later. A couple more minutes. What else? Yeah. 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 What would you say were crucial things that led to those jumps in growth from 52 to 82 or 82 to whatever the next yep. 50% growth? And then were there points in that growth that you would say you had to put the brakes on because your congregation was struggling to do? Yeah. Um, so, again, I'm going to answer this from prepare the horse for battle. Victory belongs to the Lord. I think the Lord was doing something. Um, maybe you've heard this. But some church growth books, don't get overwhelmed with that term. They'll say, people need three things. They need one close relationship, seven friends relationships, and something to do. That for a person to stay at your church, they need one close relationship, seven friends relationships, and something to do. So one of the things was we tried to mechanize that where we could. But I would say the biggest thing outside of like, what we were trying to do with messages and church and outreach. I would say the biggest thing we did was if you visited our church, I personally was white on rice to chase you, to talk to you and get you involved. And it was probably about a 75 to 80% success rate that if I got to you, you stayed. And so I just chased people down on their terms, their turf, homes, church, restaurants. I'll meet you at a ball field. <laughs> um, so I would say that was the biggest thing was we, we had a really high retention rate for guests. We really worked hard to build our volunteer culture. We really worked hard to volunteer in our community when we were small. And we really worked hard to deliver on good weekend services. Uh, yes, there have been moments where we, we've referred to them as seasons of pruning where we had to pump the brakes uh, in different ways. Now, we had to be careful with that because um, you don't want to get that elephant of momentum to sit down. It's really hard to get it back up, but we, we, we had to do some things. So, yeah. And those were different for different reasons. Some of it was numeric. Some of it was our spiritual health. Some of it was leadership. There's a variety of things in those moments. Uh, I think one of the things is if you have big growth bubbles at one moment, you should ask yourself why and do you need to lead uniquely through those. So here was an example. We were like 100 and then one weekend we literally went from 100 to 135. And the next weekend we were like 142. And it was like in two weekends. Well, I found out that a local Methodist church had had some problems. And that a bunch of those people the week before had all gathered together, left, and had come over to our church. 
So I called a meeting with them. And I met with those 45 people, bought them lunch, sat them down, and said, tell me your story while you're here, <laughs> what happened, and let me tell you who we are and what we're about and what's going to happen or not happen. And we just talked about it. And those people made a decision. But I wasn't going to like let them come and I wanted to know everything and I wanted them. And so we met with them. Myself and another leader. It was great. Bunch of those people, 18 years later, still at Grace. One of them was over at my house the other day hanging pictures because I don't know how to do anything. <laughs> he was hanging pictures for me. He was. I'm not lying. <laughs> Paul Morgan. Maybe one more. One or two more. What else we got? Leadership things we're struggling with. Things we're trying to solve. Thinking about next generation. Yeah. How, how do you lead parents? You talked about your tough love for your kids. Yeah. How do you lead parents to do that to their kids? I mean, I think you have to lead it through example. I think you have to lead it through story. I think you have to lead it through empathy to understand that it's hard. Um, but I think you also have to say it. I mean, I think a lot of us, have you ever been mad? I, I'll, I've been mad at my wife for thought bubbles. <laughs> Things that were never said that I've been mad at her for or, or vice versa. I think sometimes we get frustrated with our people for things we didn't say out loud. So have we told them, hey, we think that you're doing your kids a disservice by not leading them toughly and walk them through biblically why we think. So I think we got to lead them. I think we got to tell the story. Um, I think we got to celebrate examples of people who did it awesome, you know, and, and talk about it. Um, yeah, those are some things. It's, it's, it's I don't know, it's, it's probably, how did the guy in the gym get strong? He went to the gym every day. You know, like, it's, it's the work. It's telling him, leading him. Last one or no one? It's like the end of the sermon, the last note's been given. Yeah, go. How do you know when you're overextending the volunteer? Jordan and I co-lead our youth group, and then I also yeah. lead our young adults. And there's one leader in particular who like, is a hinge for both of our ministries. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, you know when you've asked them and they've told you. You know when they quit. How do you get before that? Um, I think, particularly if they're a high-level leader, keeping them close, checking on them. Um, oh my God, I should have spent time with this. Uh, there's a list of uh, how do you know that you're valuing a person? Okay? So like, what are all the ways that you can know that you're valuing a person? And I would say you need to know that for that person and make sure that you're doing it. So this is huge. For staff, there's like a, a bunch of different ways. I'll quickly go through them. For staff, ways that you honor them. Pay. Public praise, private praise. Those are not the same. Some people want publicly praised. Some people want privately praised. Do you know on your team who wants what? There was a church that I know that every 10, 20 years they did anniversary celebrations in front of their whole staff. This one particular lady came up to the pastor. She said, today's my 10-year anniversary. Can you celebrate me privately instead of publicly? And he was like, oh, sure. I did. Yeah, I did. So they pulled their staff. And they said, how many of you want praise publicly? How many want praise, pay, uh, praise privately? It was 50-50. Do you know what your staff wants? So pre pay, public praise, private praise. For empowerment, some people get more energy by the more you give them. They get more excited. They feel trusted and, and empowered. Five, knowledge. Some people want equipped with more information about what they're doing. So you take them to a conference with you. You bring them alongside you. They come out on the other side better. Six, adequate resources. Some worship leaders quit because they'll never update the sound system. Update the sound system so the worship leader has what they need to be able to do what they need to do. Number seven is access. Some people want access to the highest leaders. They'll continue to serve at a high level if they have access to you. That person may not burn out as long as they get to keep seeing you. But if you pull yourself away from them, they're suddenly going to get tired. They just need access to you. That happens to senior leaders all the time. There's people that are excited, and then we don't meet with them anymore, and they quit because they don't have access to us anymore. And that doesn't cost us money. 
uh, access, number seven. Number eight, input. They have a chance to speak into a decision. Number nine, this is a little bit like empowerment, but more responsibility. Number 10, perks or bonuses. This is beyond normal pay. Number 11, significance. This can show up in a lot of ways, including their job title. Some people get less tired just because you gave them a different job title. It's just true. And then number 12, time off flex schedule. We're in the process right now of asking our entire staff to rank those 12. Where, where do you feel valued and loved? So how do you know? How, do you know what gives them gas and juice and have you given it to them? And then, um, and then I, would, I would also say this, observe their joy. If you can see that they're suddenly not having any fun in it, it you got to figure something out. Let me pray for us. Can I do that? Would that be cool? Let me pray. God, I'm thankful for this room. I'm thankful for the teams and the leaders and the churches and the ministries and the individuals that it represents. And God, I pray that there would be real, real fruit and blessing um, that would come from some of the investment of today. I pray that we would all leave more excited about your local church in the future. And we know that you're going to build your church and the gates of hell will not prevail for such a time as this, that you've called us to this space at this time. Help us to nobly step into reaching the people you've called us to, including the next generation. Give us fresh eyes. Give us vision and enthusiasm. Keep our intimacy and passion for you hot and excited. God, just encourage us today, and we just give you all the glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks. Did you enjoy this afternoon? I have been saying...